The legislature is back in session. We are on Bill 363, and Senator St. Augustine, you had the floor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I uh, passed out a proposed amendment to line 18, page 2. Not too sure if legal can give us the advice on what section to put it on. But the, uh, the amendment is the approval or renewal of qualifying certificate. Notwithstanding any other provisions of law, I, the legislature go on hereby repeal section 8 of public law 34-116 relative to the suspension of all renewals and or extension of qualifying certificates by the Guam Economic Development Authority, GIDA. This section further authorized Imagala and Guam to reconsider any qualifying certificate renewals or extensions that support the reduction in the cost of insurance for both residents of Guam and the government of Guam. My colleagues, you know, earlier um, one of our, our colleagues mentioned about the separation of powers. There's already a part on the uh, Budget Act that identifies the governor has taken the, uh, the Budget Act into court and they identify the separation of powers when it talks about the hiring freeze. And my concern now is that, as one of our colleagues mentioned, the separation of powers on the QC. The QC has been the responsibility of the governor. And I believe that if the legislature wants to control how the QC is written, then let's take a look at the law that governs the creation of the QC and then reduce it, modify it in any form we feel. The QC today controls as the, the spreadsheet that was given out by the author of the bill identifies pretty much all in the insurance. The QC controls the cost of insurance, particularly with the Government of Guam's health insurance program, which is heavily funded by the general fund. The amendment does not approve any QC's renewals. Rather, it removes the suspension of renewals that Public Law 34-116 installed. Thus, the authority to approve extension still lies with the governor. Ultimately, the governor, be it the current or the next governor, would make that decision. This, this amendment does not benefit any one entity. Rather, it supports an industry as well as GMH, but it ultimately supports any individual who purchases medical insurance on island by reducing its cost. This amendment is to be prospective to the, the bill that deals with the Cortex QC, and it does not impact the QC at this time. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Senator. Senator, the intent of your amendment is very well taken. Um, however, I'm, I'm going to rule that it's out of order because it would make the bill ma materially different than what was heard in the public hearing. This amendment uh, has prospective application to repeal the budget law section that authorized the legislature to, to review these QCs at all. And, uh, but as you said, it does not um, relate to the subject matter before us, which is the QC for Cortec. Madam Speaker, I respect your decision, but I'd like to object and maybe the body will decide if it's not germane. Sure. Thank you. Uh, there's been a motion to overrule the ruling of this chair, the speaker. So um, all in favor of ov overruling my determination that this amendment was not germane, uh, please raise your hand if you're in favor of overruling. Motion fails. All right, but Senator Sinoxi on the bill, you're still recognized, so. On the bill, Senator Uggen, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I have an amendment that is being circulated at the moment, and uh, I certainly hope to uh, request your consideration and the support of the members of this body. 
I believe there's already been extensive discussion about the benefits of the captive insurance companies and the industries here on island as it applies to providing employment for our people, also broadening the tax base here in our local economy, and then also expanding economic activity. Those are all key points with regards to looking at the industry and allowing the industry to be able to bring in additional players and to participate and provide these benefits to our community. Madam Speaker, there's one thing that, that kind of stood out in my mind when I was looking at the information that was provided by the mover of the legislation, and it, that's looking at the qualifying certificate beneficiary profile. If you take a look at number 248, which, which is, this is all publicly released information, which is take care risk management services which falls under the industry category of captive insurance, the corporate income tax rebate percentage for that particular captive insurance company is 100%. Then you move on to qualifying certificate number 249, which is reflective of the Marianas Captive Group Incorporated. And likewise, this particular captive insurance company was given a rate of corporate income tax rebate rate of 100%. And Madam Speaker, it kind of concerns me if in fact Guam is seriously looking at further developing this industry by virtue of applying disparity in some of the benefits that are given to captive insurance companies. My understanding is that the documents that was approved that is before us in the legislation provides for 75% uh, income, corporate income tax rebate for, for the company that is being discussed at this point in time. And it's only fair and equitable to apply the same percentage in light of what I alluded to a little earlier that has been shared by many of our colleagues about creating additional employment for our people broadening the tax base and also expanding economic activity on island, it only makes sense that as we continue to hopefully expand this industry on Guam that we provide equity across the board. So Madam Speaker, there is a uh, amendment that, is, that has been circulated which would read, rebate of corporate income taxes authorized pursuant to 12 GCA, chapter 58, subsection 58128.4. Notwithstanding any other provision of law, rule, or regulation, Cortec Captive Insurance Corporation Qualifying Certificate Number 225 shall include the rebate of all corporate income taxes effective the date on GIDA document number 19-0293 for a period of 20 years, which is very consistent, Madam Speaker, with what has been provided to the other two captive insurance companies. For the corp corporate income tax, taxes derived from the underwriting insurance risk either in or out of Guam, including corporate income taxes derived from investing funds generated from insurance underwriting in Guam. This rebate shall follow all other terms and conditions set forth in qualifying certificate number 225, including the renewability of this rebate. So Madam Speaker, that's the amendment that has been proffered and I certainly uh, ask the support of not only yourself but the members of the body. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Sidious Masi, Senator again. Is everyone in receipt of this amendment that's been circulated? Page 2, line 18. Any member wish to be heard on the Ugin Amendment? On the Ugin Amendment. Acting Speaker, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I understand the intention of this amendment. It's very similar to the last amendment that uh, authorized that the legislature would um, allow 100% abatement of gross receipts tax for this company's um, captive insurance. And now this amendment to increase from 75% to 100% of the abatement I mean, sorry, the rebate of income tax. Uh, 
Um, my concern with this, Madam Speaker, is that um, when we got this bill at the legislature, it had been reviewed by GIDA, by their um, personnel, their classified personnel, and they gave a report to their board. And in the report by GIDA, it states that um, they, they very specifically amended the um, 100 to 75 percent on, on the corporate income tax rebate. And they very specifically said uh, they were not re recommending an abatement of the business privilege tax because based on the activities identified in the CTCIC's application, the direct benefit to Guam in relation to the direct benefit to the applicant is not substantial enough to warrant both a BPT benefit and a corporate income tax benefit. GIDA has issued reduced BPT benefits per past captive insurance QC beneficiaries, and then they, they cite a table. And in addition, the government of Guam issued its first BPT bonds in 2011, with subsequent bonds being issued since then. The provision of these bonds is at three percentage points of the total 4% BPT is reserved for bond repayment. GIDA has been cognizant of this. In the most recently established QC program, Special Hotel QC, the ability to claim BPT benefits has been greatly reduced. Now, I understand the argument that these are BPTs that we're currently not receiving by not, you know, having this captive insurance company here and that this is a corporate income tax that we are not receiving at all. And um, so a rebating 100% versus 75% is not going to, to reduce what, what we're getting at the present moment, but it will reduce what what was intended by GIDA in approving this, this QC for this captive insurance company. And, and I guess um, the concern I have is that, you know, uh, when I was at the hearing, the person uh, representing Cortec was, was very, very good at answering the questions and explaining, you know, what they wanted out of this and what they thought the benefit was for Guam. And I could see that, and I could see Gita's argument as to why, you know, they would ab abate uh, income tax, I mean, rebate income tax, and, but not want to abate the GRTs. And, and this, the corporation, the, the, captive insur the potential captive insurance company, did not ask during that hearing that, that we make any of these exceptions to what Gita had given. They seemed very satisfied with what Gita had done. And after Gita's you know, committee's review, and it's signed off by at least five people working there. This went to the board, and, and if I'm reading the minutes right, it went to the board twice, and, and they approved it with these particular conditions. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm thinking that it was the board, let me just make sure, that, that reduced the 100% to 75%. And without anything else in front of me to show, you know, the rationale for this company, why they would want it they haven't asked for for it so i i just think they're already going to be getting the qc they seem very satisfied with that you know we are here to approve or disapprove what gita has done and and if you think about the intent of having qcs come down to the legislature i mean i recall that the intent was because we were trying to curtail the the excess granting of QCs that was going to impact our revenues. And um, so I think being more generous than Gita was is, there's no, there's no evidence in here that this would curtail this business from establishing its Q, um, captive insurance or any other business. And so we're speculating that if we do not grant them everything that we can that they will not do this when they've said the opposite. They've said, we are willing to do this under these terms. And if they are willing to do this, then, you know, uh, I, I would only hope that other companies would also be willing to do this. Now, if we need to be more competitive with our captive insurance or more consistent at GIDA's level with our captive insurance, you know, eligibility or, or benefits, then I think that's something that we should, have, we should review that as a policy. But I don't want to fall into the, you know, the trap of, you know, Gita 
if you think they're acting randomly by granting one company, and, and they're not equal. So this does not make us make this company equal with the other companies because there's two captive insurance companies that were pointed out earlier. And if you read the tables, they are not equal either as to what they were given and for how long. And so, so making them equal did not seem to be a priority of GITAS. Now, if that's some policy that the legislature wants to adopt, then I think we can do that in a separate bill. Let's look at whether we need them to be equal, and that's more attractive you know, to prospective investors, or, or you know, are we going to continue to allow GITA to look at all the circumstances and do their analysis as they are doing, and, and, and thereby come up with what, uh, the formulas that they come up with as to GRT and, and income tax. So that's, that's my concern, Madam Speaker, is that is that they have not asked for this. We are extending additional benefits beyond what GITA has found to be prudent in these circumstances. And, and I don't believe under these circumstances, because the company has not asked for it, that, that it's any benefit to make it consistent with any other company. Situs Masi. Situs Masi, Acting Speaker, is that an objection to the Ugin Amendment? Just a point of information, if I may, Madam Speaker. If you take a look at the committee report, under the title of the document, Guam Economic Development Authority Qualifying Certificate Application uh, Case Analysis, Case Number 16-707-03, the corporate income tax periods requested 20 years, percentages requested 100%. Business privilege tax periods requested 20 years, percentages requested 100%. I needed to provide that clarity uh, in terms of the statement that has been made repeatedly about this is, has not been requested by the applicant. Yes, it was part of their initial submission. So just, just so for, for the record. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So just want to see Senator again. And what page is that on the, on the committee report? Yes, Madam Speaker, it's on the committee report. And like I said, it's titled the Guam Economic Development Authority Qualifying Certificate Application. But it, it's not numerically uh, numbered, or it's not numbered in the report. Sidus Masi. On the Ugin Amendment, any other member wish to be heard? Senator Rodriguez, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I rise in support of this measure. And I want to also confirm that, um, that uh, the applicant did request for 100% of the income tax rebate. Um, I, I, do, I know I had a copy of a letter that was also sent from Cortec Captive to GITA before the decision was made requesting and laying out uh, the supporting um, facts why they should be granted the full benefits of the law just like uh, the other uh, captive applicants were um, were granted as well, so uh, we have to ensure that that's clear on the record that it was it was asked. Um, second, um, you know this this whole um, um, argument of of being uh, equal and being um, fair really is something that we must take seriously here from this body. Um, if you look at twenty um, third Guam Legislature, I believe it's Public Law twenty three dash one o nine, which um, which authorized the, the QC for, for, for captive insurance. Um, as I said earlier, this came about from governor, um, former Governor Carl Gutierrez's vision, I believe it was Vision 2001 Task Force on Economic Development. Um, and you read, you read the enabling legislation, uh, you read the committee report, you read the, the statements from the former governor. This was supposed to, the vision was supposed to be a robust captive insurance industry here on Guam, just like they have in Bermuda or the Cayman Islands. Now we have other U.S. destinations. I said earlier, Vermont um, is um, the third worldwide um, who, who has captives domiciled in their, in their state. And if you take a look at what the whole intent was, we're, we're doing it all backwards, Madam Speaker. You know, we, we, we have that opportunity to be right in the forefront of, of getting um, investors here on Guam, parking their money here, having that circulated you know, in the economy. And, and here we are arguing that um, this applicant should only get 75%. They shouldn't be ent uh, entitled to 100% abatement. Um, we don't know if the legislature should be doing it or not. It should be the governor or it should be Gita. We're stuck 
right now doing that, Madam Speaker, when there's so much opportunities. And I encourage our, our, our colleagues to, to, to look into this, look into this industry, look at the potentials that, um, that this industry has to bring to our community, look at the incentives that we're offering and how we can leverage that. Um, and again, go back to 23109. Look at what the whole intent was and what um, the whole uh, roadmap was for what this was supposed to be on Guam. And if you take a look at that, you understand that, I think this, these other things that are, you know, that are coming up and, and perhaps um, you know, making the argument that why are we doing this, they didn't ask for it, um, it's just totally, it's, it's such a small, I mean, you, we have to open our minds and really be able to, to do this right, and we have that opportunity now to be able to do that. So I, I support this amendment. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Susan Smosse, Senator. Acting Speaker. I just write, to rise to a point of information. I said in my testimony, or my debate, that they, when they came before us, what they had requested, and they, of course, they requested from Gita everything, but they were very satisfied with what they had negotiated with Gita, and when they came before us, they asked us to pass the bill as is, and they did not request at that time any, any additional benefits. During and when the public Gita, hearing, is that correct? And when and when Gita negotiated this package, it's a package. So if we're going to increase one fact part of it, you know, does that mean we, we should require more of the community investments that they are making or things like that? Because those are the things that Gita considered when they came up with the entire package. We gave them, you know, uh, no abatement of GRT yet, you know, only, only a $50,000 um, community fund deposit or something like that. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Susan Smossi, on the Uggen Amendment, any member wish to be heard? On the Uggen Amendment, Senator Espaldon, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I, you know, the, the, the presentation of uh, relative to this amendment always goes back to the benefits of really taking a look at the overall picture of the captive insurance industry and why we should have it. And I don't disagree with what they're saying and what they're proffering. However, the previous speaker uh, uh, did mention that if we are going to attack it and take a different view to try to, to, try to I suppose, um, accept the vision that was proffered back when the, when the law became in effect, I think it was the 25th legislature, then that's a whole different policy call that needs to be crafted in a separate bill. In this bill, again, I guess the problem I have, I still don't know quite certain in my mind whether we even have the ability to do this. It's a separation of powers issue. Otherwise, if a QC comes down that has already been vetted by Gita and has been approved and negotiated and examined by the board that we actually confirmed here in this legislature, basically saying that yes, we will trust you to make the best decisions on behalf of our island in your capacity as a board member of Gita. And then it comes down here and we overturn their decisions, then what's the purpose of the board? What's the purpose? We might as well just transfer all qualifying certificate uh, 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 issues down here to the legislature and not let the board handle it at that end. And that's what I don't get. That's what I don't get. If this company did request for 100% on the rebates, but after much investigation, analysis, and discussion, came up with something different and said, well, okay, we may not agree with you that 100% should be given, 100% rebate should be given, but I tell you what we'll do. We will still make it attractive, and we will still allow you 75%. And that was the decision of the board. And that's what came down here. For us now to second guess why the board made the decision to go with 75% of the rebate as opposed to 100, 
without considering the deliberations they went through, the board members went through, would almost, like I said, be an injustice to the decision of the board and all the work that they did and all the considerations and analysis that they had to undergo to try to get to that point where they said, here's what we believe is fair. Here's what we can grant you. We will give you 75% of your income tax, corporate income tax. And yes, previous speaker was correct. When at the public hearing it was brought before this body, there was no request to reconsider the conditions of the QC that was approved by the board. It was as is. If you approve this, it will benefit us directly and we can then benefit the island. That, in essence, was the testimony of the company who has been granted this QC. For us now to embellish everything, uh, grant them uh, privileges that, that were not in the QC as determined by the board might be going over what we really should be doing. Whether it's, and that is, I believe, whether to approve the QC as it was approved by the board. I have real concerns with that. And I'll tell you why, Madam Speaker. If, let's take a whole different hypothetical uh, situation in which the Gita board granted 100% of tax rebates and an abatement of all GRT, and that QC came down here to the, to the legislature for approval. And this body says, well, no, we disagree. We disagree that this applicant should not get 100% rebate and should not have an abatement of GRT. So what we'll do here as a body, we will reduce that 100% to 50%, and we will do away with the abatement that was granted by the board at, at Gita. Don't you think that the applicant would then take this to court and say, wait a minute, we negotiated this, Gita gave us 100% uh, uh, rebate, rebates on income taxes, and they gave us full abatement on GRT, and now the legislature is saying that no, they're going to change the conditions of this QC because that's what they wanted to do? I would imagine, as an applicant, and I probably would too, say, hey, let's go to court. They don't have the power to do this because we already negotiated it. The board approved it. They went through the whole analysis and they said, yes, 100% on the rebates, full uh, abatement on GRTs or uh, business privilege taxes. And so where is the legislature coming from when they reduce the benefits that a QC provides that was already granted? And that's the opposite situation here, right? they would definitely go to court. In this case, I don't believe that the company, if we pass these amendments, would go to court because it definitely benefits them. But as was previously mentioned, right, it was the board who made the determination of whether or not to grant 100% on the tax rebates or not. And they came along with the conclusion, they came to the conclusion that because of the effect on revenues and this and that, this and that. And again, I haven't read, I have, I have to reread the, the committee report, but bottom line, they said, no, it's not gonna be 100%, it's 75% based upon our analysis. And that's the determination of the board. And it brings me back to the initial, one of my initial questions, well, if the board determine it, do we have the capacity to change it? Considering, and if we do, then why does the board even have to be involved with this? Because we can just set it right here, here in this body. Every time a QC comes up for, for negotiation and whatnot, then what purpose is the board if we're not going to trust them to make the best decision on behalf of this government? And so I have a problem with this amendment and the previous amendment that was passed. Because, it, again, legal counsel did, did say there may be an issue of separation of powers. And to me, as a legislative body, in terms of crafting laws, one of the primary threshold hurdles that we need to make sure that we clear is whether the policy that we're enacting passes constitutional muster. 
and here we have not done that. We have not allowed the legal counsel to take a look, a good look, at that issue to guide us in this. And I, I think that really perhaps demeans what we really are here for or takes away from the job that we're doing. Because again, that's the first hurdle, I believe, whether the law that we are passing is organic or constitutional, and we have not addressed that issue yet. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Senator Espaldon. Senator St. Nicholas, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, I listened intently to the two retiring speakers, and I just, um, it puts me into a, a, a quandary in terms of being able to reconcile the, the, the messages as they, as they seem to conflict. Uh, the objector to the amendment um, clearly stated that it was perceived that the whole point of reviewing these qualifying certificates here in this legislative body would be to consider whether or not we should reduce the um, abatements that the GITA board was um, negotiating. The retiring speaker um, says that exploring that option would create uh, an avenue for potential litigation. If the whole point of us authorizing this legislative review process wasn't to affect reductions in abatements, or to affect increases in abatements, and if the QC contract was something that had to be signed off by a Mag Magalahi or a Magahaga, then what's the purpose of it coming before this body? And so I can only conclude that the reason why this body passed the requirement for these items to come before the legislature is for the legislature to affect whether or not there is going to be an increase or a decrease in what was being proffered uh, as, the, um, as the benefit for the company. And for me, reconciling that, I step back and I look at, it, I look at the big picture of what we're talking about. And first of all, I think that this measure and the amendments attached to it and the amendment that I'm speaking on now, I think that they're a, a victim of circumstance almost in terms of the named party. Madam Speaker, if we look at the QC beneficiary profile that was passed out earlier, we see only two companies under the line item of industries considered captive insurance. And if you move over a little bit and look at the column of corporate tax rebate, the only two captive insurance companies that have received a corporate in income tax rebate have received a 100% corporate income tax rebate for captive insurance industry. This amendment is to make this qualifying certificate consistent with what has been issued by the agency. And that kind of takes me to um, the point of, you know, how, how are we evaluating industries and saying one should get 75% and another should get 100%? And if we're not being consistent in the um, awarding of these particular types of rebates, what kind of message are we sending to other industries that we may want to attract with these very same programs? You know, you're going to come on in and you're going to go through a two-year process and you might still end up with less than what everybody else is getting. I mean, it's just, it's, the, whole, the whole circumstance is very, it does not send the right message for a community that's trying to attract investment. And when I say that this seems to be a victim of circumstance, it makes me wonder, you know, if this was Microsoft, Captive Group, or Berkshire Hathaway Captive Group, or Johnson & Johnson Captive Group, I think we'd be falling all over ourselves saying, oh my goodness, we're attracting these Fortune 500 companies. But when it's a local company, one of the few local companies is actually winning contracts up here in this military buildup, all of a sudden, we don't want to give them the same 100% that everybody else got. We want to give them 75%. And so that lack of consistency and, and just my, you know, I mean, maybe they shouldn't have named it Cortec Captive Insurance Company. 
We need to be consistent. That's important. We need to reconcile the fact that if this body really did want the authority to be able to review these QCs for the purposes of potentially reducing the benefits, then the knife cuts both ways and also should be afforded the opportunity to potentially increase the benefits. And if the increase is not out of the norm of what these other captive insurance companies have, rece have received, then is the debate really something that is extraordinary or are we talking about just trying to bring the entire application up to, a, up to parity with what the entire industry has been awarded? And that's why you know, I, I, I tend to agree with the retiring speaker. Perhaps the legislature has no business being involved in this, but the legislature has decided to be involved in this when it passed that provision in the law to involve itself. We can't now say all of a sudden we don't want to if the needle is, if the, di if the needle is dialing into another direction. I would be concerned if we were starting to say things like we're going to give 150% rebate. That would be pretty extraordinary. And the reality is that, technically speaking, there's nothing to preventing that from happening either, where all of a sudden we turn these rebates into actual liabilities. And that's why you know, I'm not a big fan of the government, and particularly the elected officials, um, becoming arbiters in these kind of, in these kind of um, discussions. But like I said, if the point of creating that threshold was to potentially lower the benefits, then it could also be to potentially increase the benefits. And so now it becomes the will of the body. What's the will of the body? Do we want to um, support this amendment and bring this qualifying certificate application up to par with all of the other captive insurance companies that have been awarded a 100% rebate? That's a question before the body. I don't find it to be an unreasonable question for the simple fact that it's consistent. And if we're going to really try to grow a captive insurance industry, remove the fact of who the applicant is. If we're really trying to grow a captive insurance industry, then consistency, consistency in what it is that we're going to be putting on the table is so vital to making sure that we're going to be able to get, get through the front door of those eventual Microsoft or Johnson & Johnson or Berkshire Hathaway captive insurance companies. Because once they see there's all kinds of variables and they have no idea whether or not there's going to be some kind of unknown that's going to stall them for two years, we're going to have the most difficult time attracting the industries. So I think the question that this body really needs to ask itself is, are we going to make this QC consistent of all of the others? Are we going to set an industry standard by passing this amendment? Or are we going to all of a sudden abandon the very responsibility that we asked for when we asked to review these QCs? For, like I said, the reason brought up in the discussion from the objective of the amendment to potentially lower the benefit. So let's, uh, let's um, evaluate this not based on the applicant so much, but based on the industry and based on the standard and policy that we want to establish. And I'm a very big fan of treating everybody consistently. And if all of the other captives received a 100% rebate because we want to grow this industry, then surely this captive should likewise have the same. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Senator St. Nicholas. I'd like to write to a point of personal privilege, Madam Speaker, uh, where the previous speaker keeps um, mentioning that somebody in here is acting based on who the applicant is. I don't know if he's talking about me, but if he is, I, I, I ask for personal privilege on that because that is not my intention at all. What, what is different between what happened in previous QCs for captive insurance and the current situation that we are in is a fiscal crisis that we faced in the last budget and that we are going to face in the upcoming budgets. That's the difference, Madam Speaker. Thank you very much. Senator St. Nicholas. Just a point of information, Madam Speaker. As the, the previous speaker also noted in her previous discussion, this QC is a zero revenue question. This QC is not going to be, deprive this government of any current revenue. If it's going to deprive this government of future revenue, it will be at the expense of having attracted the investment and having retained it in order to have it grow our tax base. And so the reality is that, one, we're not going to lose money with this QC, and two, we may actually increase the revenues and address the fiscal crisis with this QC. Sidos Masi, on the Ugin Amendment, any other member wish to be heard? Point of information, Madam Speaker, and I hate to go back and forth, but 
That's incorrect, and that's inaccurate. That's a not correct portrayal of what I said. I said, this amendment is going to reduce what the government would receive under the, Q, the QC um, as it is. This amendment clearly reduces the amount of income tax that this company would have to pay. On the Ugin Amendment, any other member wish to be heard? There's been an objection to the Ugin Amendment, so we'll call for the question. All of those in favor of the Ugin Amendment, please indicate by raising your hand. Amendment passes. Senator Ugin, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You know, Madam Speaker, we all understand and know that uh, anytime that the, the government is faced with some fiscal challenges, that we always try to ensure that we aggressively go out and pursue any outstanding tax receivables or any taxes that otherwise could be paid by businesses that we try to generate those taxes. But like was mentioned by one of the previous speakers, right now, conceivably, we could have from this particular applicant, approximately $2 million going off island, offshore, that it's not being retained on island in our local economy. It's not being taxed, other than the regular corporate taxes or, or business taxes that the existing company provides. One of the challenges that we all have, and, and I was just thinking about the fascination of all of the different minds in this hallway, Madam Speaker, when you have an ind individuals who have an educational background, you have individuals who have uh, military backgrounds, you have individuals who have legal expertise, individuals who come in with information and a, a perspective about infrastructure. That's one of the wonders of this legislative hall because when there's time to deliberate, we all have to come to the meeting of the minds. We all know it's a numbers game in terms of making sure that we're able to attain the sufficient number of votes to get an initiative passed or an amendment passed. But in this case, Madam Speaker, I think we also need to look at the expansion of our economic base. One of the challenges that we had initially and one of the, re the justifications and the arguments that was made about bringing this particular process to this body and not allowing for any qualifying certificate to be administered for the duration of when the law is in existence is because we did not want to exhaust any possible revenues. But we need to entice businesses to come to Guam. We need to encourage businesses on island to be able to invest and to spend the money. And in this case, it's a domestic business that is willing to invest resources, retain some of their financial resources on island, and invest it and spend it here. And that's what we have to also maintain in terms of our perspective. Because we can try to be as enticing and create as many incentives to bring businesses to Guam, but we also have to support the businesses by providing even an interim incentive or tax abatement or rebate so that they can come here, provide or create jobs and opportunities for our people, and then eventually that should phase out. And then they will be direct contributors of the tax base. But unless we look at it from that perspective, we may have a scenario, just hypothetically, if this business does not want to establish a captive insurance, regardless as to the name of the business, then they will still continue to send their premiums off island. And the idea behind the captive insurance is to allow for these funds to remain here, whether we want to apply it as a self-insurance policy with, the, with this company or other companies, allow them to retain the funds and the resources on island so that it can be utilized and benefit our local community. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Senator Again, On the main motion, Senator St. Nicholas, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, it's oftentimes brought up in discussions on this floor and even throughout our community 
about trying to diversify our economy, building that elusive fourth leg of our stool that currently stands on federal spending, military spending, local government spending from the expenditure of tax revenue and fees, and tourism. And for decades, this conversation has been ongoing, trying to find how can we diversify our economy to smooth out those dry spells that we go through whenever our tourism numbers drop, or whenever federal spending becomes more constrained, or whenever, for whatever purposes, our local tax revenues aren't coming in at the rate that we'd like them to. We have, throughout the conversations in this community and in this body, wanted to diversify away from our reliance on the military-industrial complex. We don't want to have to keep growing the military presence as a means to try and sustain the economy. And, and personally, I, I think that if we can definitely diversify away from that, it will be a lot more sustainable because otherwise we're at the mercy of Department of Defense and them trying to figure out what their global priorities are. And the reality is that, you know, that the, the fitting of Guam into that doesn't always end up the way we'd like. But in order for us to diversify, we need to begin building the industries that are going to help us diversify and become that fourth leg of our economy. And if you were to um, do the work necessary to evaluate our industries and our our labor base and our payroll base, you will find that the two biggest opportunities for us to diversify our economy lie in financial services and telecommunications. One of the things that you'll also find is that those are some of the best employers here on this island. I have the privilege of having worked for a local bank, um, and I know that the starting pay for a teller is almost double what you'd make in many other businesses at the entry level definitely 50% more. Same goes for the insurance industry, and I know the same goes in most respects into the telecom industry. Good jobs that pay not necessarily a living wage, unfortunately, but a lot more than the minimum wage that currently has our own government subsidizing people at the ITC, um, with other uh, programs, even the federal government having to step in and subsidize with certain programs. If we're going to truly diversify our economy and create high-paying jobs, we need to attract the investment and the industries that are going to do that. One of the reasons why I'm, I'm not such a big fan of how the QC program has been managed in the past is because I don't think that they properly apply the um, rationale as to whether or not the benefits that they're giving out are for those industries that we're trying to grow or those industries that are already mature. We have a lot of mature industries that continue to receive tax rebates and tax abatements that isn't resulting in a lot of growth. And some of these mature industries that are receiving these qualifying certificates are some of our worst paying industries. Without naming it, because I'm just not, I just don't want to have to go there today, but one of them that has a lot of qualifying certificates has an average hourly wage of $9.49. And so those are the kind of industries that we really need to reconsider, is it in the people's interest to continue rebating or abating those revenues? Or should we be recapturing those revenues because the government is having to subsidize the low wages that they pay their workers? That is not the case of financial services. That is not the case with the telecom industry. And if we're going to really create that fourth leg, the wisest thing we can do is to make sure that we're applying these incentives to the industries that are going to grow that fourth leg and do so while paying our people a wage that isn't going to require government subsidy. Financial services is that industry. There's so much potential. As a matter of fact, um, our neighbors in the Federated States of Micronesia have a thriving captive insurance industry. It's really transforming their economy because they've acknowledged the fact that bringing in those revenues is going to create the investment and create the jobs that are going to help improve their circumstances. For us to be here today with a captive insurance applicant that has been going through this process for two years, two years, 
speaks volumes. No wonder we're having to try and attract more military spending. No wonder our government revenues continue to struggle because we're subsidizing other industries that aren't paying our people well. A two-year applicant that could have gone to a dozen or two dozen other locations and gotten approved in four days on average. One of the biggest impediments to attracting investment is this kind of government bureaucracy. And the ironic thing is at the end of the day, after two years, the abatements came out to 75% versus what was given out in previous years in, 2000 and, in 2007 and 2009 of 100%. And if we've done this before, why did it take so long? I'm not, I'm not intending to um, identify anybody when I, when I mention that uh, the company in question is, is perhaps the reason why. But if you've done it before, it shouldn't take you two years to evaluate it and do it again. But the unintended consequence of us not being consistent is that it screams to the industries that we're trying to attract that coming here and bringing your business here is not going to be something worthwhile. And we as a community out here in the middle of the Pacific already have enough challenges with trying to attract those kind of investments. There's even just an awareness gap. One of the great privileges I've had of being able to be out in my orientations over, these past, over this past month, and, I, and I'm grateful for the body for, um, for understanding why I, I wasn't present in certain circumstances, was I was able to really see firsthand the gaps. But more importantly, Madam Speaker, there's so many opportunities to fill those gaps. I was very fortunate to be able to in my attempts to, uh, and, and successful attempt to um, become a member of the Hispanic Caucus, I spoke to some very powerhouse members of that caucus, and I started telling them the story of Guam, and saying, hey, you know, Guam has these opportunities. I knew it was the first thing they said to me, Madam Speaker, they said, you know what, let me put you in touch. Let me put you in touch with certain people who might be able to take advantage of those opportunities. I have a conference call tomorrow with a very high-level money manager who works very closely with other jurisdictions because of some of the opportunities that we spoke about. But the concern, Madam Speaker, is we can fill those gaps by getting in the door and making the acquaintance and extending the invite and bringing them over. But if the, if the system isn't built to actually facilitate the investment, then not only are we going to lose that initial opportunity, but in the very small world of those kinds of companies that might be looking for what Guam has to offer, it wouldn't take too long for that reputation to spread. And so I come back, I mean, I've, I've always been an advocate of this kind of development, but I come back with an even more informed perspective that as much as we tend to focus on 25% versus 100%, the global view that we're missing is what the message is being sent to everybody else that we're going to try to attract here. And if the message is not well received by one party or two parties, it doesn't take long for it to spread around to all other parties. Because as anybody in any industry will know, industry players talk to each other. I mean, even just on our island alone, we have the hotel and restaurant industry. And trust me, you do one thing wrong to one member of an industry or you create one hurdle for one member of the industry, everybody in that industry is going to find out. And so I know that the members of this house, and I know that the Magahaga coming in, and I certainly know myself, we're committed. We are very committed to trying to drive our island forward and make sure that we create these higher paying jobs to reduce the amount of government subsidies that we need to put out for some of the lower paying industries that are receiving these benefits. We definitely want to diversify the economy and build that fourth leg of the stool. But we're going to have to make sure that we have our act together and that our circumstances are in place to be able to attract these industries. This isn't just one bill about one company, it's a policy statement, Madam Speaker. It's a policy statement as to whether or not we're going to be consistent with what we've issued in the past, whether or not we're committed to investing in these industries and growing these kinds of high-paying jobs, 
or whether we're going to continue to allow for something that should have been a more streamlined application stumble around as it has for the last two years. It's actually quite amazing that this company hasn't gone to another jurisdiction. It's really easy to set up in another jurisdiction. And there's, there's no impediments to it. You can self-insure anywhere. You can park your money anywhere. And if you park your money in jurisdiction X, you're going to be investing that money in jurisdiction X and creating the jobs in that jurisdiction. And where do we go when we lose that opportunity? It's kind of out of sight, out of mind. No harm, no foul. We didn't, you know, we didn't lose something. We just never got something. But then that's what keeps us from moving forward. That's what causes us to continue to fall back on the few things that we've been relying on. And all of a sudden, then we're, we're trying to get more federal spending or we're trying to figure out how to bring in the next uh, tourist investment. And the diversification never happens. And so as we, as individuals weigh whether or not we're going to support this, I would also like to reach out to the incoming administration and ask them to please review these kinds of processes. If we can streamline these things and make there be less bureaucracy, if we can try and get ourselves up to a point where we're at least on par of other jurisdictions that we're trying to compete with for these kind of investments and resources, then it becomes so much easier for us to turn relationships and opportunities into actual outcomes. But it's going to require us fixing and making effective and efficient what we have here. And this isn't just a bill for a qualifying certificate for a captive insurance company. This is a saga of why we don't diversify why financial services isn't growing the way it can grow if we just have the right systems in place, why our people are still being stuck in a lot of these jobs that are paying nowhere near what they need in order to make it out here on Guam. The only way we can change the narrative is if we change the narrative. It's not anybody else's fault that we're not able to get these kind of things going and building those, these fourth legs and attracting these investments. But if we're going to do it, it cannot be happening like this. It cannot be these kinds of stories. It's one of the reasons why, Madam Speaker, as much as it wasn't popular over my, my terms of service here, I've been very, very staunch about us fixing what isn't, what isn't working right here. Because it's not about, oh, you don't like so-and-so or so-and-so's in office or you don't like this person who was sitting in that position. Our ability or our inability tells a story. And if that story is not something that attracts, then it's going to be something that repels. And if it repels, then we're not, going to, we're not going to change, we're not going to grow, we're not going to improve. I humbly ask my colleagues to strongly consider supporting this legislation and further humbly ask the incoming administration to very closely look at the qualifying certificate program. It cannot be working like this. It has to work a lot better than this. There needs to be a clear understanding of what, what is a mature industry versus what is a, a, an industry that we're really trying to grow and attract. And the the facilitation and the benefits and the rebates really do need to go to these kinds of companies, these financial services companies, these telecom companies that we're trying to attract here, and not to the mature industries that are still paying our people $9.49 an hour and not giving them health insurance. I can't speak for all the other financial institutions, but I'm pretty confident it's consistent. You go and work at the bank that I used to work for, you'll get paid at least, I think, $14 an hour starting. And you'll have health insurance, which is not just a benefit for the individual, but it relieves, it relieves the taxpayer of having to subsidize your health care. Let's attract these industries. Let's make sure that we have the right government systems in place to be able to bring in these investments. Let's not only make this effort that we have in this government be about opening the door and getting people to look at Guam, but actually liking what they see so they come here and they invest and they change what our people are going through on a daily basis. That is our responsibility. 
And I really hope that today, with this measure, but more importantly, into the future and going forward, that is going to be something that becomes the norm and not the exception. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Sujaswasi, Senator Sir Nicholas. On the main motion, any member wish to be heard? Senator Castro? On the main motion, Senator Estevez, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, you know, a lot's been said. I, I just want to admit, you know, as I rise in support of this measure, that I was a staunch critic. Um, you know, just to tell a little story, uh, when it was first introduced and um, I received a copy for a review um, from, from my colleague, you know, right off the bat, before even a cursory review, I said, there's no way. And, and really, the bill went to the lowest priority um, on, in my pile for bills to review and assess. Luckily, I was able to, you know, burned a lot of hours to get to it, and I reviewed it. And, you know, I reached out after reviewing the transcripts and the committee report, or transcripts from the public hearing, the committee report, and I reached out with additional questions because I was still very skeptical. And I asked very pointed questions regarding, um, regarding the matter to try to determine, determine the reason why. And so I'm sure if I had these questions, others in the community have the same questions. The first thing I asked were, were, were there any underwriters, local underwriters, that you could potentially insure through for the type of coverage you're looking for? And it, was there a need for the captive insurance? And you know, the, it was very clear um, after some discussion that there is no local company that can cover up to the amount that was needed uh, for adequate, adequate coverage of the asset. And so this led to the cap need for captive insurance. However, because we're not, this is still a growing industry, um, or really it, there's, it's a very small industry on the island, there was the initial need that this, the company, this company had to insure through Goldman and Sachs. And for those that don't know, Goldman Sachs is definitely not a local company, definitely not in need of that type of investment capital that, the, that our local company had put into it. But albeit, that was the necessity at the time. I just want to be very clear, too. And, and another question I asked was, you know, is this going to provide an unfair benefit to a particular business. And, you know, after reviewing, after scrutinizing, after discussing, after researching, I do not believe that it does. We have to keep in mind that with everything going on, with respect to the buildup, because, you know, it's been alluded to and it's been discussed about the company in question. And even me, I had my, my concerns as well, and that's why I asked the questions, and that's why I did the research and did my, acted on, in due diligence. In terms of the large-scale construction contracts going on on the island, the company in question, Cortec, is the only truly local domestic company. It was, it was brought up by a retiring speaker that you know, it's it's an amazement that 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 this industry didn't go somewhere else, and that the money stays here. And I think that really ties into what we're trying to do here, because the owners, the executive makeup of this particular company, are bona fide Guam residents. They are locals. The only company of this scale doing these types of projects that are local. You take any of the other familiar names, you know where their owners are? Everywhere but Guam. And so it doesn't necessarily amaze me. I don't necessarily agree that, you know, it's amazing that the money stays here. I'm, I'm, I'm happy. And I believe that we have a responsibility not only to grow local industries, such as captive insurance, but also support synergy between other local businesses to help grow. The mere fact, I think what is amazing is the fact that we're growing lo locally grown industries are able to compete for projects. And we're seeing it with some of these build-up contracts are able to compete 
with billion dollar businesses. Businesses that this is all they do. They, they, they look for these military contracts globally with billions of dollars backing them with their own captive insurance, with money holdings in many different locations. And the fact that we've had and did our best to have a pro-business environment on the island has allowed for these local homegrown companies where the owners have a vested interest in the benefit of the island, in the welfare of the island, where these owners are going to reinvest. That's how we feel more confident that there will be a reinvestment in the island. Why? Because their children are growing up here. Their grandchildren are going up here. Their houses are here. Their churches are here. Their schools. And so I do, you know, again, and, and I'll admit, I've, I've never been one not to admit when I was wrong. And, and I will be the, I'll, I will do it again, and I'll admit my initial onset of this piece of legislation was very much in opposition. I didn't even want to entertain any qualifying certificates. And so with that, I do rise in support of the measure. I do agree that there needs to be consistency within the industry, especially if you want to grow it inconsistencies in terms of in, in what the government provides would do would be contrary to what we're trying to do in terms of promoting a business because it would then provide an unfair advantage to the businesses that have already been operating under full rebates and full abatements um, of their qualifying certificates so it does not produce and have a very conducive investment create a very conducive investment opportunity or an environment uh, for pr this particular industry and other industries. And um, I thank you for the opportunity to speak on the measure, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Senator Estevez. On the main motion, any other member wish to be heard? Acting Speaker, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I want to rise in, in support of the, in, the original intent of the creation of this um, qualifying certificate um, category, the, this economic incentive and diversification of our economy. I support those things, Madam Speaker, and I, and I support um, this applicant's venture into this captive insurance industry. I agree that the systems of review and the priority the priority that we are giving to the different uh, industries uh, in our QC process, that these, those should be reviewed and strengthened. I applaud um, the company involved here. I, I, am, I applaud Cortex's willingness to abide by the terms of GITA's staff and GITA's board analysis as to what was reasonable under the circumstances according to GITA. And they made findings you know, they went through every category that they do with other QCs, and, um, and one of the findings that they made was that the creation of employment would only be one employee at about $30,000. That they would use the location of their existing Cortec International Office spaces, not any new office. It would be a slight reduction on the purchase of local insurance. It would be... Um, and then, of course, they explained the benefits of the economic activity and that keeping the money here, how Cortec um, would be able to enhance the financial position of Cortec International, which in turn will assist them to serve the local affordable housing, government um, capital improvement projects, and commercial development and construction industries. Along with the findings, Gita made recommendations, and their recommendations were uh, $75,000 of rebate of uh, corporate income tax, no abatement of uh, business privilege taxes, and that the Cortec Captive Insurance Company Corporation would, would um, donate $50,000 in community contributions every year. 
the package all looked reasonable to me at, at the public hearing, especially after you know my questions were answered. But I want to really applaud most of all the, um, the CEO, his candor with the legislature at that public hearing, where he told us all, you know, that only one employee would be made, would be, um, you know, born out of this. Uh, that how he told us. So, he estimated how much in corporate income tax that would be, the 75%, or you know, the, uh, how much would be rebated. And he, he also told us, which, which I really very much appreciated, he told us the government of Guam can do much better than other states and countries with a captive industry because we have no, sta no state tax on Guam. We could require that we could require, and, and I thought these were excellent uh, suggestions, and I was hoping that, that that might be incorporated in a bill, but, but not yet, so. But that we could look at requiring that they deposit the money uh, for temporary use by the government of Guam, or that we must, that the corporation must invest on Guam versus in stocks or any other type of investment elsewhere. So they have, um, according to Gita's findings, kind of indirectly promised that they would invest these things in their, their current activities on Guam. But uh, he had made that recommendation for Guam in general, you know, in the captive insurance industry, that those, those are things that we should consider putting in as a matter of policy. And so I just want, want to say that and what I really think um, makes Guam unattractive is things that look like um, preferential treatment or, you know, um, government involvement that, that, you know, I don't want to say corruption, but, but that but just makes us look like we're trying to do something like that. And I'm not saying that's what anyone was trying to do here, but I'm just saying when a company comes in and they're completely satisfied with the terms of the agreement and the legislature wants to go out of its way to give them more benefits, it's, um, it just doesn't sit well with me, Madam Speaker. And, um, and I, and I realized that we, you know, maybe we want to make this company's benefits equal to some company that was given, not by us, but, but by Gita, in a whole other time. And I just think if we are going to do this industry because we think it's going to benefit us, then we need to get as much benefit as possible. And we have the opportunity here, or we had the opportunity here, you know, to do what, what looked reasonable. And so. I just wanted to put that on the record, Madam Chair, and, and to express my appreciation for this company for their willingness to abide by Gita's original terms. Sidhu Masi. Sidhu Masi, Acting Speaker. On the main motion, any other member wish to be heard? If not, Senator Rodriguez. Oh, I apologize. Senator Espaldon, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, First of all, there's several things I want to say. One is that I actually rise in support of this legislation. And again, I won't have to, I don't want to reiterate everything that's been said in the positive note of why we should support this, which actually leads to something even greater. When it comes to terms of who the company is, it's, it's of no importance to me. It's a, and, and in this case, if we want to mention that company, yes, it is Cortec, and I, I myself actually admire the growth that they've experienced. They're good businessmen, good business people, have, gone out of, uh, have gotten contracts because of their due diligence to go after them, and so I respect their efforts on the business side. My issues previously were with the amendments that were introduced not with the concept of whether we should approve the qualifying certificate for this particular company. I believe they applied for it. And again, like I said, the Gita board did decide what they decided, which is to give them a 75% tax uh, rebate 
on their corporate income tax, but it did not include the abatement of gross receipts, nor did it reach the level of 100% rebate on the income tax for whatever reason. And I guess it's those reasons that we have not examined, which are the reasons of the board of, the, of GITA of why they did not give 100% as other companies have received, right? Um, and in this case, they gave them 75%. The arguments on the floor basically reflected everything in favor of the company who applied, and I have no problem with that. But the thing that we, the, the, the side that we did not examine were the reasons of why GITA and the GITA board opted to give them less than 100% on the tax rebates and did not grant the GRT abatement. That being said, though, as pointed out by our colleagues on the floor, and that's the beauty of the debate on the floor, is to be able to listen to all the various perspectives that everybody brings, and whether it's from a macro perspective or a micro perspective, applying it to a macro perspective, it really gives us all a chance to pause and understand the ramifications of passing a legislation such as this after all is said and done. The arguments are fruitful and it, and it benefits all of us in terms of, and it, and it benefits even the public so they can hear the various perspectives that are being proffered and argued on this floor to understand why we're gonna make the decision that we're gonna make. That being said, I just wanna make perfectly clear that my issues were on the amendments themselves and not with the issue of whether or not this QC should be granted. The QC was approved, even though the terms have been di are, are different now, uh, based upon the amendments, but the intent of the board of GITA and its board was to grant the qualifying certificate to this company in line with, I, with what I believe to be consistent with the intention of the QC law relative to captive insurance companies. I stand in full support. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Senator. On the bill? All right, uh, Senator Rodriguez, would you like to close? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I want to thank our colleagues for the um, healthy discussions we've had on this, on this piece of measure, Madam Speaker. Um, I, I, won't, I won't say too much because a lot already has been uh, said and presented. I want to uh, thank um, um, Senator San Nicolas as well. Um, and give him extra, extra recognition, really, for his, um, present, his eloquent presentation on what uh, a captive um, insurance really is. Um, because I think, um, Madam Speaker, a lot of the um, misconceptions that we've had, or some of those in the community may have, have had, is the lack of understanding, really, of what uh, a captive insurance is. And that's why earlier, as, as well, I've asked and encouraged um, our colleagues and the public to to review the enabling legislation, um, Public Law 23109, to really understand what this whole industry is about, what it was meant to be, and what potential it has for Guam. Um, I do want to address um, certain comments that were made on the floor here about um, this particular applicant being um, perfectly fine with what, with what they were provided. I, I don't think that's the case. I don't know if anyone in the public hearing, I wasn't there, unfortunately, if anyone asked them straight out if this was what they wanted, if there was there anything else. But if you look at the record, what was on record and what was requested by the applicant, they requested for the full benefits of the law. Um, in, my, um, in my sponsor statement that I provided to the committee, which is part of the committee report, I did indicate that um, if there was a GITA representative there, I wanted, to, I wanted it on record as to why there was inc in inconsistencies of um, this applicant receiving less than what previous applicants received and what is um, authorized in law. And so I want to ensure that um, today, I said that for the record, that these issues were, were apparent and upfront with us even from the beginning. 
Um, another issue I'd like to address is that even prior to introducing this, this measure, I've worked with our legal bureau, and um, you know that this whole provision of of what was incorporated in the Budget Act that that required that any QCs before the governor's signature um, or approval must come before this body for approval. When really uh, we've given Gita the authorization um, to vet these applications, make the recommendations, not approve, but only recommend to the governor who has the authority, just like what we're doing here now. The governor really has the authority to increase, decrease, remove whatever their, his GITA board presents to him. And I've seen it in the past, that there, there have been recommendations that the GITA board have, um, have um, passed and recommended, and the governor of Guam has that, has that authority to, to change, you know, whatever is, is finally um, on that contract. And so, um, you know, I, I don't agree with that provision that, that, that has to make it come here to us, but that's where, that's where it's at. That's where we're at. That's where this body at that time had the wisdom to say, no, it must come here. And so that's why we're here. That's why we had the opportunity to do what we just did here. And so, um, again, uh, I thank my colleagues for, for their support on this, for their healthy discussion. And I, I want to ask those that may still not um, um, have decided on how they want to uh, vote on this measure. But we have an opportunity, Madam Speaker, to, um, to, to correct this misperception that I, I really do believe that, that, that we have in terms of um, being inconsistent in terms of being um, unfair in how we're treating this particular program. Um, I've talked to professionals in the industry here that have said, look, uh, this, this, is, this, this news of how this, this particular QC is being, um, is being handled is really sending a negative effect. And really, when they look at Guam, it's looked at as an unfriendly type of atmosphere. And so we have that opportunity here today to correct that. Um, even more opportunity for the next um, body, 35th Guam Legislature, uh, to make the changes needed to hopefully do what Senator St. Augustine tried to do in, in repealing that section of the budget law, um, but also um, greater opportunity for the new admin executive administration, um, as our congressmen-elect have, have mentioned, to be able to, to work together and, and really take advantage of these types of industries that uh, will allow us to have less dependence on tourism, on tourism revenues, on, on military revenues, um, because the, the financial industry is, is, a, um, is a source of revenue that back in 1996, our leaders then saw it, um, that we still have that potential even today. So again, I thank my colleagues and ask them to please support this measure. Sidus Masi, Madam Speaker. Sidus Masi. On the motion to place bill number 363-34 on the third reading file, is there any objection? Hearing no objection, motion carries. We are now on bill number 337, Senator Estevis, you are recognized. And the, there's been another version of the bill put into your second reading folders, it's as corrected. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move to place Bill 337-34 as corrected by the prime sponsor into the third reading file um, on behalf of the Committee on Public Safety, and I'd like to speak on the matter. Please proceed. We have a, a floor amendment that's been adopted uh, yes. according to the clerks, so we'll proceed from that point. Yes, thank, thank you, you, Madam Speaker. Um, just to reiterate the points, I think if I just wanted to highlight the, the difference between the, the version that my colleagues had seen prior and the version that was actually submitted and that was supposed to be placed in the folders, which is the corrected version. Um, there were a couple of typographical and grammatical changes, but the main, the main thing that was, that's different from the versions is on page two, line eight, um, subpart B. And what that is, it's, of progressive experience of no less than 15 years uh, versus the 10 prior. Now the 15 years is to be consistent with the progressive experience that's required for the chief of police 
and the fire chief. And so that's the main change besides uh, some of the gr grammatical corrections. And so again, um, before opening it up, the intent is to have an attempt to have the most qualified individual fill this capacity role as the director um, of Guam Customs, Qu Customs and Quarantine. Thank you. Senator Esteves, did, did you have an amendment? Because we've adopted Senator Uggen's amendment. Are you proposing an amendment? Since, I, I just want to confirm though, because there was the, the wrong copy was placed in the folders. It should have been the as corrected. So I think we had disposed of the previous amendment, Madam Speaker. Yes, that, the Senator and Uggen so, amendment to add in the words business administration. Correct. And so um, if, if just a, maybe a question, parliamentary question, since the version that was actually put on, originally put on was the as corrected version, is that the version that we're discussing? We're discussing the as corrected version. So then I, I would have no amendments because right. this is the correct version. All right, thank you very much. All right, on the, on the bill, Senator Uggen, you're recognized. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, thank you for recognizing that the uh, previous version that was discussed on the floor, that there was an amendment that was inserted into the previous version, and I'd like to ensure that uh, based on proper protocol, that that particular amendment is properly adopted. So, Madam Speaker, I'd like to move that based on what this body is presently discussing on page two, line 11, and line 14, that right after the word administration, comma, insert business administration, comma, and then continue on with those respective lines. That was the amendment that was proffered previously. That's correct. That's been adopted. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Is there any other discussion on the bill? Bill 337. Senator Adda, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I, um, I certainly uh, support the idea of establishing um, uh, the, the qualification requirements for the director of the Customs and Quarantine. However, I do have some concerns about the uh, qualification requirements that are being uh, proposed here. Uh, the first concern that I have is on page two, line seven, which establishes a uh, minimum age requirement of 35 years of age. And I, I'm concerned that we may be um, icing out uh, younger folks who may be fully qualified. So I take, for example, uh, a young man who graduates from high school, you know, his father and his brothers are with customs and quarantine, and, um, and this young man wants to become also a customs inspector. So right out of high school, He's able to get into the customs agency, and he works hard, he studies hard, uh, he goes to school at night, and, um, and, and so he meets the 15 years of, you know, so I mean, 15 years, that's, I don't know, what's, what's the basis for that? But, but, but there's, who's to say that this young man at 30 years of age is just as qualified as a guy who's 35. I mean, you can take that to the other end and, and say that, you know, uh, you can't be more than, than 65 years old because then now you're too old. So are, are we treading on, you know, some kind of age discrimination here? Now, I know that to run for senator, you have to be, we establish the minimum requirement of 25 years. But I just, I just have a, a serious problem with establishing this 35-year-old this uh, limit, age, age requirement. Um, so with that, I, I, I would like to, to make my first amendment and strike that age requirement. Just because you reach 35 doesn't make you a, a good candidate, you know, and you may meet all these other requirements. Just because you're 35, all of a sudden now you're magically qualified. 
So I would move that we remove that um, that age minimum age requirement. On the motion to delete subsection A on page two, line seven, it reads be at least thirty five years of age. The motion is to delete that. Is there anyone who'd like to speak on the motion? Senator Munya, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I also uh, agree with the, the retiring speaker that uh, 35, I'm not sure what the basis of that is, and I know that uh, some, like, like an elected official, we, we have the right to, to determine the age requirement, but here I think maybe we may be infringing on some of the EEO laws, and so I still agree that maybe we should just strike that out as well, too. Thank you, Madam Speaker. On the amendment? There's no one else who wants to be recognized on the amendment. Senator Adda, you may close on the amendment. Uh, he's waving closing. So all in, is there, there's no objection. Is there any objection to the amendment to delete subsection A? Is there any objection? Senator Stevens, do you have an objection? On the amendment, please proceed. Madam Speaker, I don't, I don't rise in objection to the amendment. Um, I, again, I'm not the author of the bill, but sponsoring forward, I'd just like to provide a little bit of input. I don't think that it's gonna have a negative effect on the bill. All things, all other requirements considered 15 years of active service in a similar capacity, as well as having to have a bachelor's degree would put them around that age anyways. So removing the age restriction uh, does, does not diminish, I guess, the, the efficacy or of the requirements that's to be mandated. But at the same time, I don't believe this is gonna be basically putting somebody fresh out of, out of college and out of the academy into a directorship position. The idea uh, and intent, again, on the piece of legislation is that we focus and have requirements that, that the person filling these agencies are fully qualified. And, and I'm not saying that somebody younger could not necessarily fill that position, but this does apply additional protections um, on, on political patronage, which we know has, has been um, a consideration of the, of the constituency, of our constituency, that political consideration is more value than qualification. And so I think it's still in keeping with the intent of the legislation, and so I don't object. All right, uh, there being no, uh, is there any objection to the amendment? Hearing no objection, motion carries. Senator Adda. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, I, uh, as I was reading down the uh, list here of qualifications, uh, again on page two, line 19, requires that the individual has to submit to and pass a drug screening test, including but not limited to urinalysis testing, to urinalysis testing. I'm fine, I'm fine with all that. But what I don't understand then is what follows. Unless the appointee is a current employee of the government of Guam, registered with the peace officer standards and training, as a peace officer occupying a test designated position pursuant to the department's drug free workplace. And I read that and read that and I'm not sure I understand what that is. And maybe if somebody does, then please tell me. Otherwise, my amendment would be that that criteria should be to submit to and pass a drug screening test, including but not limited to urinalysis testing, period. On the amendment, Senator Stevis, you are recognized. Um, Madam Speaker, I'm, I'm gonna have to object to the amendment. I think the language is, is very clear. And so as I've stated previously with this particular measure, what this allows is for recruitment to come within the organization. And so what this does, it does two different things. Um, item F, if you are not coming from within the organization as subject to 
the department's drug-free workplace under the post standards, so you're not coming from the police department, you're not com coming from any law enforcement, but you meet the requirements, you would have to submit a drug test to a drug test, um, basically like if you were just getting into the military, because they don't, they don't know, right? You're coming in fresh. Whereas, as it says, unless the appointee is a current employee of the government of Guam, subject to the standards, then we know they've already been doing the testing according to the policy. So it would, you know, why run them through the test again? Why add additional bureaucracy? Why add additional cost to the government of Guam if we already know that they've been tested and screened? And so that's how that section, that particular item is supposed to work. So one, if somebody's coming from out without or outside of the agency, and then one, if they're coming from within the agency, it's basically an exemption or waives the need for additional drug screening. And so I have to object to the amendment, uh, Madam Speaker. All right, any, any other member would, want, would like to be recognized? Senator Sir Nicholas on the amendment. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I actually support the amendment and, and, and here's why. If you read it very carefully, um, as was pointed out by the mover of the amendment, the first section there would require that a test actually be taken. The second part, just says that if you are an employee of the government of Guam registered with the peace officer standards and training as a peace officer occupying a test designated position pursuant to the department's drug free workplace program. It doesn't mean that you actually had to have been tested. I think that um, we see like for example when we view, review the budget digest of agencies they have drug testing in their budget digest but it just never takes place because it's one of those things that if there's no funding they don't do it. I think that by just amending it the way it's suggested, we will ensure the position will be tested and it won't fall through some potential gap that might exist if we create a window where you won't have to take it if you're a particular employee, whether or not that position was ever tested due to availability of funds. So if the intent is to make sure the applicant is tested, I think that we should just make it be a standard requirement of the applicant and not try and create some kind of exception in the event that the applicant may have been tested because the reality is that that's not the way this is written. It says that you are, if you are an employee in that kind of designation, then you don't have to take the test, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you've been tested. So I think that if we just go off the amendment, I think it will satisfy all parties and meet the, um, the hurdle that's trying to be achieved here by making sure that a test is actually conducted and passed. Thank you, Senator. On the amendment? The amendment is on page two, on line 20 through 23, to delete the words beginning with unless, all the way to the word drug-free workplace program. So it would delete unless the appointee is a current employee of the government of Guam. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I would just like to request that if the amendment were to pass that legal be authorized to make the grammatical corrections uh, with regards to the commas. Any, any objection to that amendment to the amendment? Hearing no objection, that, uh, that amendment carries. On the original amendment by Senator Ada, is there anyone who would like to be recognized? And if not, there's been an objection. Uh, so all in favor of the Ada amendment on lines 20 through 23, please raise your hand. Uh, amendment fails. Senator Adder, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, um, again on page 2, line 24, uh, one of the requirements is to be of good health and good moral character. Um, now, I, I guess we determine uh, good health as a result of, as determined by a medical exam. Otherwise, I guess we could ask the question, are you in good health? And I could say yes, and I could be all messed up inside. Uh, but maybe uh, if we qualify that, that, that you, know, you be of good health as determined by a medical exam, then certainly that's a lot clearer. And uh, the other part there, of course, be of good moral character. Well, I know your father and your mother, so you must be a good person too. Um, 
but I would just like to make the amendment to add on that line 24, be of good health as determined by a medical exam. On the amendment to add on line 24, after be of good health, to add the words as determined by a medical exam. On the amendment. Is there any object, uh, Senator Espaldon, on the amendment? Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I guess my concern would be, even if you do have a medical exam, what determines whether you're in good health or not? In other words, you go to a medical exam, you get, take a medical exam, your cholesterol is high. I mean, you're actually in good physical shape, but your cholesterol is high. Does that qualify as not, a, not in good health? Or if your blood pressure or your, your body fat content is out of norm, does that determine that you're not in good health in spite of really being in good health? I think there are many people on this island who probably have issues with those specific uh, determinations, you know, whether it's blood pressure, whether it's cholesterol, and whatnot. And so I, I'm not really sure, w you know, how this will be interpreted, right? So you go to a doctor, you, he looks in good health, but his cholesterol is high. Is that a cause for the applicant or the nominee not to qualify? I don't know. And, and you know, I, I guess that that, and, and even just this whole this whole thing, be of good health. Uh, how do you determine that? Again, it, it, the issue or the the hypothetical hypothetical situation that I present applies even to that determination of good health. If your cholesterol is higher than what should be, are you are you automatically disqualified? I don't know. Uh, you might be able to do 100 push-ups. You might be able to run five miles within a certain time. You might play basketball three times a week. You might be active in all kinds of activity. But does that one issue of perhaps having high cholesterol, higher than, way higher than what it should be, disqualify you from consideration? So um, I just need to bring that up because I, I think it needs to at least be considered. Thank you. On the amendment, Senator Munya, you are recognized, and then Senator Sinicus. Yeah, I'm a little bit concerned as well, Madam Speaker, about adding in a, a requirement from a, a physician or a doctor, because what really qualifies you for this position, I mean, I kind of imagine it like a, like maybe a, a sports team and, and you go get a physical and they say, okay, you're, you're qualified to join this sport. Um, I, I can't see what the health requirement would be for, for this position. Uh, and, and like, like the previous speaker said, there's so many things. It's so vague what, what you consider good health and what do you consider bad health? Um, so I don't know if I, if I would, uh, support adding on a, according to a doctor or a physician. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Senator Sinekles on, on the amendment. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I understand the intent of the mover of the amendment, trying to somehow make it less subjective, but um, I'm just concerned that uh, even, even the best efforts at this point um, could, I mean, not result in, in the right outcome. Um, and as was raised by one of the retiring speakers, you know, what if um, a certain component in, in, your, um, in your labs is, is, is beyond um, what is considered within the norm, are you considered in poor health? And I can speak for myself, Madam Speaker, just on the body mass index alone, I'm considered obese. And um, I'm, I, 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 have, I have definitely put on some weight during this campaign season and, and overall the stress that that, that entails, but um, you know, what is the true metric going to be to determine whether or not there is an actual um, health issue, or what is good or, or not good with respect to any medical examination or, or any kind of, of testing that's done. Uh, and, the same, and the same goes for the, the good moral character. Um, there's just a lot of, it's, it's very subjective. And I understand the intent of creating all of these, all of these um, 
um, standards is to try and, and um, craft parameters to get ideal candidates into the position. But the danger is that if we have too many standards, we're also going to really have nobody available for the position. Being at least 35 years of age, I'm, I'm 37, and you know, I just I wish I was not in the obese category on the BMI index. That probably wasn't several years ago. But that being said, there's also other other health things that come come with age. Being 15 years of service and progressive experience in a customs enforcement agency is surely going to result in a lot of stress, and we all know how stress affects the body. So. You know, the good, health, the good health component, we definitely want our applicants to be healthy. Um, but I just, I cannot imagine us not wanting to confirm an exceptional candidate because they have elevated cholesterol levels. I mean, that's just, I, I just don't see us having to, by law, as a mandate, reject an applicant. Or worse yet, if we put it into the law, and they get the job because they got approved by the legislature and the governor gave them the job, can somebody come back and challenge it saying, hey, you know what, in his application, his cholesterol levels were above the normal range, not even, not even considered high, just above the normal range. Can I, can I go to civil service and say this individual um, um, got the job and I should have actually gotten it because my cholesterol levels weren't elevated? So I, I understand the intent of the move of the amendment to try and tighten up what is already a very subjective category. I would, I would recommend that instead we strike the category altogether. Um, health is a, is a very different kind of subject. And if we begin to create a legal framework from which it can be judged for whether or not somebody should have gotten a job, I think we're going to find ourselves uh, before the Civil Service Commission a lot more uh, perhaps in court a lot more, and it's, it would be actually the detriment of trying to find the ideal candidate to provide stability to the agency. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Senator. On the amendment, on the amendment, uh, on this, the ADA amendment, Senator Stevens, you've already been recognized on the ADA amendment. All right. Um, you're recognized, I'm sorry. Oh, that was Senator Espadon, yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. You know, I, I do appreciate, I actually do support the amendment. I, it is subjective, but it's subjective for a reason. There's a reason why the candidates come before this body to make the determination. We're not making the determination whether or not we don't want this person because they have high cholesterol. We're making the general ass assertion as a body, it's the appoint as the confirming body as to whether or not this person is of good health to do the job. There have been many instances um, in recent times and prior years where, you know, there, there have been people who have come, in, come into these positions um, who have health issues that nobody is aware of. And I'm not saying we need to know all the details, but the end result has it been numerous in numerous lost manpower hours, trips off island once, once they're able to do it. Every time you have, find out, try to find out where the director is, they're in the Philippines. There's a medical issue, there's a medical issue. Never around, not conducting business. That's the intent. Furthermore, remember this is a paramilitary organization, which means there is the potential for, for there to be phys phys physical aspects to it. Right? If, if we expect our police officers and peace officers to be out there doing the post-examinations, uh, it's not a requirement in here necessarily, but we should expect that the director of this paramilitary organization is somewhat fit or at minimum in good health. It's imp an important part of leadership. It's about do as I do, not do as I say. And in paramilitary and military organizations, this is key. Now, I'd also like to state um, that prior to the pro pro uh, proposition of the amendment, line 24 is almost verbatim of the current law. This is the requirement we have of the police chief. This is not new in statute. 
And so this, you know, it's been discussed. I believe it's subjective for a very valid reason so that this body has flexibility to make that determination. And if, as stated, something were to happen in terms of a medical, potential medical issue, this body has also flexibility to discuss and debate whether or not these qualifications are still met under, under the law via oversight hearings. And so it's not like, it's not a simple process. So aside from the confirmation process, there's the oversight process to make sure there's a determination that the person filling these positions remain qualified. If there are extenuating circumstances, Madam Speaker, I have full confidence in this body that they're not gonna boot an administrator or, or a director, and, that, and, and for the record, it is still gonna be at the, at the discretion of the governor, regardless of what this body wants to do under the current law. They're gonna still be an at-will employee. Um, but as I was stating, it allows this body flexibility to have the conversations if need be to ensure in a very transparent way that the person placed into this position is always gonna be the most qualified person we can. If we have to make exceptions, it's the exact reason why it's, it's subjective and not very strict. It doesn't put a specific LDL, LDH um, and, and cholesterol number you need to have, specific blood type. Those are specifics that could disqualify. But I think the subject, subjectivity is key. I don't oppose the amendment because I think it highlights that, that the doctor, as we would with any other job, um, if you want to take a particular medication, if you want to start a new workout plan, you have to consult your doctor to make sure you are in good health to conduct whatever business you're going to conduct. This is not a one-time thing. This is a normal thing. So if somebody who's, you know, questionable, you know, I might have high cholesterol, but I can ask the doctor, do you think this high cholesterol will interfere with me conducting my duties? And the doctor will make the assessment. And that's between the patient and the provider. And having that, and I, I don't oppose the amendment because I think having that, if, if, if it were to come up, would only, would potentially benefit the individual who might have medical issues. But if the doctor says, yeah, you might have high cholesterol, you might be missing a leg, but you're fully capable and fit to do the job. Because it's not just a simple matter of whether they are or not, but to have no requirements, um, I think would potentially put us in a situation we've been in, in before, where the director is nowhere to be found because they're constantly, you know, getting off island getting medical att attention. And I, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, I'm not saying that their medical needs should not be attended to, but if there are other options that we could avail ourselves to, to ensure that the public work is getting done in a timely fashion, then we should be able to do that. And we should be able to assess. And it hasn't interfered with the, with the recruitment of the fire or police chief position, which have these same requirements in them. Um, so I do support the amendment, Madam Speaker, um, and, and, and I, I just hope that there's not a further amendment to delete the entire uh, subpart. Did you say you support the amendment? Okay, so on the, the ADA amendment, um, to, is there anyone who would like to speak? All right, the ADA amendment to recap is on page two, line 24, subsection G, after the words be of good health, to add as determined by a medical exam. On the ADA amendment, is there any objection? There was an objection. Uh, all in favor of the ADA amendment, please raise your hand. Amendment fails. Senator Ada, you have the floor. On the bill, Senator St. Nicholas, you are recognized on the bill. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Again, I, I applaud the author of the bill for trying to create a framework from, from which we're going to have um, a, a filtration system, so to speak, with respect to who eventually would become the um, director of the Customs and Quarantine Agency. I'd like to thank my colleague who um, proffered the amendment to strike line seven. Um, I, I very much agreed with the sentiments um, behind uh, the striking of that section as expressed by some of my colleagues. I also have a concern, Madam Speaker, with um, um, section B on page two, um, particularly with the way it's written. 
Um, when you read it, it says, they shall meet the, fo the following quali qualifications. Have no less than 15 years of progressive experience in a customs enforcement agency and three years in a customs enforcement position with or equivalent executive management experience in the field of public administration, criminal justice or law, or a closely related field or discipline. My concern, Madam Speaker, is 15 years of progressive experience in a customs enforcement agency actually creates a very, very narrow pool of potential applicants. Because on Guam, we only have one customs enforcement agency. And that means that we're either going to hire only those of 15 years on the job, or we're going to have to find somebody from off island working in federal customs. Um, actually, really, only federal customs would be relevant that has 15 years or more experience. And I have nothing against the customs officers who have that much experience in the agency today. Um, I know some of them very well. But sometimes also you're going to want to bring in people who don't have the same kind of institutional, um, institutional practices in place that they can try and do things a little differently. You might want to bring in somebody who has less than 15 years of experience uh, because they have a very different outlook on what can be improved. You do something for 15 years, sometimes you get really um, stuck in the, in the system and you don't become a change agent of that system. And while, while I don't necessarily need to um, or want to speak so much as to whether or not there needs to be a change agent in customs, there may eventually need to be at some point. But if we're only going to be allowing for those of 15 years of progressive experience to be assuming the position of the director of customs and quarantine, and that means that if you, you know, if you weren't rocking the boat and if you, you know, put your nose to the grindstone and, and toughed it out for 15 years, you're gonna be able to make the grade versus somebody who might, might be more of a change agent that can go in there and, and maybe do things a little differently and improve the organization. Um, I, I think that 15 years would be far too restrictive. I think that if you have 15 years of experience in the agency, you have already a natural advantage for the position. I'm sure you would have a lot of seniority. You would hopefully have achieved a, a, a better rank. Certainly you would have had a lot more experience than a lot of any, than any other applicant with less progressive experience. But that wouldn't necessarily mean that you're the best person for the job either, or that you'd be the best person given the needs of the agency at the time. We may have uh, an applicant that uh, has a lot less progressive experience, but a lot more education or a lot more exposure. And we may want to have their um, fresh perspective and new ideas um, take the leadership um, position within the agency. And so I think experience is important, but I think that 15 years of progressive experience in a customs enforcement agency creates such a narrow pool I don't even, I, I haven't done the, the due diligence to pull up the, the staffing pattern, but we can probably pull up the staffing pattern and see how many employees in customs right now would probably fit within that category. And those would be the only ones who would be able to take the job. So I don't know how to amend this necessarily. I don't want to say 10 years. I don't want to say five years. But I just don't think that, that, that 15 years either is, is necessarily a, a proper hurdle. So I would, I would like to raise that point and perhaps yield to the body and come back and hopefully generate some discussion on, on that area to see if there's any other uh, wisdom that could be shared by the body on how we can try and find the right balance between having a candidate with experience but not limiting it to a pool of, of, of only certain employees who may have become a little too institutionalized to be, um, to be the, the, the change agent that a, a Imaga Haga or Imaga Lahi might be looking for in the future. If I may request a one minute recess, Madam Speaker. One minute recess, granted.
The legislature is back in session. Senator St. Nicholas, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, in, in conferral of some of my colleagues and looking at some existing statutes, I think that we may be able to find a way to um, mitigate the, um, narrow, um, the narrowness of this particular section that I raised. Um, first, I would like to uh, amend on page 2, line 9, uh, the word customs and change it to the word law. So it will be progressive experience in a law enforcement agency. This would open it up to marshals, corrections officers, anybody in law enforcement, CIA agents, I think. <laughs> no. Thank you, Senator. So on page two, line nine of the bill, Subsection B to read, have no less than 15 years of progressive experience in a law enforcement agency. On the St. Nicholas Amendment, any member wish to be heard? Any objection to the St. Nicholas Amendment? Any objection? Hearing none, motion carries. Uh, Senator St. Nicholas, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. In that particular section, too, I wanted to definitely address that one. I don't know how the, the members may feel about this next one, but I feel like 15 is, is still rather long. I was hoping we can perhaps consider 10 years as, a, as, a, as the um, threshold for progressive experience in a law enforcement agency. I think if you put in 10 years as a customs officer, 10 years as a police officer, you know, 10 years as a, a marshal, um, you definitely have the progressive experience necessary to be able to relate to the demands of uh, the remainder of the, of, the, uh, of the agency to which you'll be uh, overseeing. So I would like to uh, amend 15 down to 10 years. Thank you, Senator. On the St. Nicholas Amendment, Senator Estevez, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I respect the sentiment of the mover of the amendment. I'll, however, I have to respectfully object. Um, I believe the 15 years of progressive history in a multitude of potential law enforcement agencies, which that amendment had done, is essential. It's important to understand that in the military and paramilitary organizations, experience is critical to adequate and proper leadership. Even in the military, you can progress quickly, but there are still restraints on how far and how fast you can go. You can't be a private one day and be the general the next day. Um, experience matters, and that's crucial with working with individuals in this agency um, to the success of its operation. I understand there are arguments about being a change agent. I don't necessarily agree that people usually just go with the flow. In these types of organizations, um, police, fire, paramilitary, and in the military, they're called paramilitary type, type organizations for a reason. It's because when you're a private, you're a private. You're not going to there, go there and try to tell your boss how to do their job. right? You bide your time, you learn, you understand, and then when you are in a position of change because of your work in progress, then you make the changes necessary. That is when, in these types of agencies, that's when you become the agent for change. Because anything else is mutiny. And they can have potential, uh, a negative impact to the entire operation of these types of organizations. That's exactly why they're referred to as paramilitary type organizations. And same thing with the military. So I, while I agree, yes, there, there needs to be change coming from within. But, and, and it's important to promote new ideas and new ways of doing things, but they have to be backed by the proper experience. They have to be backed with the, the intricate, knowing the intricate details about a particular agency. And those things can only really happen with a, good, a, a decent amount of time. We've already amended it so that we can have a, they can have a multitude of law enforcement experience. But what if I had 14 years of experience in the Guam Police Department and one year, one year in customs, plus maybe four years as a senior customs or three years as senior customs chief, compared to somebody with 15 years in the agency that's just waiting to have the opportunity for that position because they have 15 years of knowledge and history in that agency. 
And when they, they are finally given or granted that uh, ability to run that agency, they will make the necessary changes that they can do. And so I, I really believe that changing that to 10 years really strikes at the heart of the bill, which is ensuring that, you know, even though we're requiring 15 years, um, the three years in customs is, in senior customs is important, but having even some, some scope or at least half or some amount of that lower level, or as we would say in the military, that, that enlisted experience, being there in the field, being there in the, in, the, in the foxhole, in the gutter with everybody else, is so crucial to understanding the day-to-day -day operations and the detail operations of Guam Customs or any other type of uh, law enforcement organization. Um, so I, I respectfully oppose to the amendment, and um, I, I move, I, I'd like my colleagues to please uh, consider keeping it at 15. Sudo Smasi, Senator, on the Nicholas Amendment to change 15 years to 10 years, Senator Ada, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I rise in support of the amendment. However, I, I got to say that I don't think we've gone far enough. And so I, I think, you know, we have a lot of young individuals who joined the military right out of high school and, uh, and, and basically make a career of the military and spend 20 years. And if you get a really high speed individual, that individual may retire as a sergeant major uh, from the military uh, in 20 years. At that, at that point, he's now a 38 year old individual who's uh, probably ripe for, a, well, who is ripe for a second career uh, in senior management. Now granted, maybe that individual was not in a law enforcement unit, but I would say that over a 20 year period, that individual certainly has developed uh, lots of skills and planning, uh, certainly is very disciplined, um, certainly has developed good management skills. And so maybe when he returns to Guam, um, he pursues a second career as a, in, in customs and quarantine. And, um, you know, four years has, gets to learn the culture of, of that particular law enforcement agency. But the way we have it here, that guy would never be able to even dream of being appointed as a customs director until he's at least 48 years old. And so we've kind of limited our pool of potential candidates because he doesn't have that 15 years of law experience, despite the fact that he has developed over his 20 year military career, um, you know, many of the other senior management skills. And so while I support the amendment, I, I don't think we've gone far enough and I think we are, we are shrinking the pool of prospective candidates by putting in such a stringent requirement uh, now, I understand, you know, uh, if you've only had four years experience and nothing else, okay, that's, that's, that sounds, uh, you know, but, but um, I think the way it's, it's written here is that he's got to have, uh, okay, progressive experience. Uh, and then you know, maybe three years of senior experience or with or equivalent executive management experience. So at least with that, we've provided an alternative, but uh, with the first part, you know, that he's gotta have been in law enforcement for all that, we, we've basically shrunk the pool of perspectives. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. On the St. Nicholas Amendment, there's been an objection to the St. Nicholas Amendment. Any other member wish to be heard? If not, Senator St. Nicholas, you're invited to close. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I very much uh, defer to the wisdom of the retiring speaker. He's, he's absolutely right. I'm actually quite uncomfortable with the bill overall. I mean, the whole reason why we have advice and consent for these cabinet level positions is so that the applicants can be vetted based on what they have to offer for the position, and then it's up to the elected body to determine whether or not that's sufficient for the agency um, to be able to um, be properly managed. 
And while I understand the intent of the overall bill is to try and, and create a parameter of, for an ideal candidate, um, as was very well put by the retiring speaker, you could have some pretty exceptional people out there that you're all of a sudden excluding because you're creating ar ar arbitrary categories. Um, and, and granted, yes, absolutely, um, 10 years uh, of progressive experience in law enforcement could potentially uh, exclude the um, hypothetical applicant that the retiring speaker was talking about. With respect to the references to par paramilitary organizations, um, I think it just needs to be, it needs to be re-emphasized that this is a cabinet level position. And similar to the cabinet of the United States of America, uh, it's the president to appoint and uh, Congress that provides advice and consent. And you don't limit the appointments to the Secretary of Defense based on whether or not they've put in 15 years in the military. Um, wise leaders would definitely choose those who have a, a, a good amount of experience necessary to understand the organization. But this is a civilian position. And, and for a reason, it, it deals with uh, it deals with the civilian community and the and the enforcement of the uh, customs operations with respect to our civilian community. I I think that ten years, I mean, I'm trying to find a compromise here, but I, I very much agree with the retiring speaker. I really feel like we we, we shouldn't mess with advice and consent so much. Um, we should make sure that those who are applying are law-abiding citizens, um, but starting to create these, these parameters, basically even with 10 years of experience, or if the objection holds 15 years of experience, basically any governor coming in would need to only look at any applicant that has 15 years of experience, or you don't fill the position. That's not conducive to uh, stability for the organization or to the advancement of the governor's agenda that is their mandate to move forward being elected by the people of Guam. All of these cabinet level positions are supposed to be executing the mandate of their elected leader. What if all of those who have 15 years of progressive experience all supported the other guy? All of a sudden, the only people that you can hire are those who may not be interested in executing your mandate and the people of Guam put you in there to execute that mandate. So advice and consent is actually something very, I'm, I'm very touchy about it. I very much agree with the retiring speaker. I'm trying to find some kind of a compromise because in the event that the bill were to pass, the more flexible it is, the more likely we, we will be able to ensure that uh, Imaga Haga will be able to appoint somebody who's going to fill the, the mandate. You know, in the States, there's some um, activities that are going on that, that could arguably be construed as similar to this, where outgoing legislatures are passing measures that are going to bind the hands of the incoming executive so much so that they're going to be unable to govern as freely as their predecessors were, even though they had a very clear mandate to go in and do things differently. I don't think that that's the intent with this piece of legislation, but what we will be effectively doing by passing this, not necessarily the amendment, but definitely the bill altogether, is we're gonna be tying the hands of Imaga Haga in a way that wasn't previously constrained when uh, Imaga Haga was going out and asking for the people to vote for her. And is it right for us to all of a sudden put those constraints on after the election? You know, those are all things that are, are with, the res with respect to the retiring speaker, are really starting to, to weigh in heavily on me. Um, I'm going to go ahead and maintain the amendment uh, whether it passes or fails, but um, I, I think that it is becoming quite apparent that um, I'm actually leaning against us tinkering with advice and consent. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Situs Monsi, Senator. On the St. Nicholas Amendment, there's been an objection. All those in favor of the St. Nicholas Amendment changing on page two, line eight, from no less than 15 years of progressive experience in law enforcement agency, now down to 10 years. All those in favor of the St. Nicholas Amendment, reducing it to 10 years, please indicate by raising your hand. Amendment passes. Senator St. Nicholas. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. It was brought to my attention by my colleague to my immediate right that um, on page two, line nine, after the word senior, we should also change that word to um, law enforcement position. So strike the word customs and replace it with the word law. Thank you, Senator. On that amendment, any member wish to be heard? Line nine of the bill, three years in a senior law enforcement position. Any objection? Hearing none, motion carries. Thank Senator you, Madam Sinicholas. Speaker. Thank you. And then I come to page three. Um, the first component, lines three to 13. I can see what the intent is here. Um, right now, we have these, um, executive, these executive positions, the director positions. And um, even most recently, with the pay adjustment, um, there was some intent to try and align compensation of heads of agencies with a study that is provided. I'm, my history is kind of a little foggy having gone through that process so much, but I don't I'm not quite sure that the current salary scales of those positions are commensurate to what was actually recommended in the study. But the point is that we usually do studies to determine pay. What this section here will do is it does establish that they shall be paid based on a compensation schedule of heads of agencies, which usually is determined by a study, but it also creates a window for the, ch for the compensation to be determined based on the three-year average of the annual income earned immediately prior to appointment. And so what that means is, let's say, for example, the, um, the, the, the director's position pays 90000 but you've been a classified employee for so many years and you're getting paid 110,000. Um, one of the, the, the common arguments is no one wants to apply for the director position because if they do, they're gonna take a cut in pay. Uh, and while that is a valid argument, on the other side of the coin, if we do make compensation at the director level commensurate with um, an average income of whoever is appointed, what they previously had, I'm concerned that we may be skewing um, the studies, the executive pay scale studies going forward. And so while we may want to make an exception for one individual to be compensated um, 110,000 for a position that pays 90,000, going forward, if we do future studies, they may increase the, um, the, the executive pay scale because the previous person holding the position had a higher wage scale and not necessarily because that wage was aligned with what the standard wage is for that position. I think that the intent to try and find a way to make higher compensated classified employees willing to take on leadership that has a gap in their compensation level, I think that that's a very, very good project to undertake, but I don't think that this might necessarily be the right mechanism to do it. Perhaps we need to create um, uh, a provision in law that allows for a special incentive to be provided, uh, like a recruitment incentive or, or something to that effect by Magahaga. Um, but to just automatically apply the three-year average classified salary to the position um, would, would, create, would create some challenges. So for example, let's say we brought in somebody who had $110,000 in average salary for a position that was paying 90,000, and they were in the position for a couple of years, but they vacated it after two years because you know, they want to retire. Does the next person get hired in that very same position at 90,000? But if it was worth paying 110 for, why are we gonna go down now and pay 90? So it just raises a whole lot of compensation scale questions, and I'm not sure it, this is the right way to be addressing that. And then it further goes on to say, that on page three, starting on line 11, said three-year average shall be reviewed annually to determine if mandated pay increases would have affected the three-year average. So let's say I was, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not very familiar with the customs positions, but let's say I was some kind of, you know, third level or even second level um, uh, manager in customs. And they came in and they did a wage study on just the, the non-executive pay positions and they bumped up the pay of that particular position. That would, the way this is written is you would immediately increase the pay of the director because the pay of the subordinate increased. 
or you would increase the pay of the director because the subordinate position that they were previously in got an increment. And that is outside of the realm of, the, of what is considered when studies are done to determine the compensation schedule for heads of agencies. And so we're going to, again, through that, through that mechanism, be providing means for pay adjustments to be taking place at the executive level that had nothing to do with the performance or pay study of that particular executive. Things are happening underneath, and it's just bumping up the person on top because we mandated it to happen, and not necessarily because any kind of review or performance factors were uh, affiliated with that position. It's just, again, a, it's an aberration of, of, the, um, of any pay studies that are done and the um, compensation schedule that's established for heads of agencies. I further have concerns, Madam Speaker, on page three, lines 18 to 20, um, which allows for the reinstatement of the position previously held immediately prior to such appointment. Now, I, don't, I know that this is not necessarily going to be the case, but there is a risk that let's say I was the head of one division and I got promoted to be the, the boss of the overall agency. With this, with this provision in place, I immediately get reinstated to my position prior to such appointment. I would have a vested interest as a director to make sure that that division got the best chairs and the biggest office space and the most pay adjustments and that you know, they had the, 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 the best, you know, the best of the best with respect to every other division. It can create empire building where, because I become the director and I have this right to immediately go back to my position, I can just flood that, that division of resources and, and special treatment and, and then say, hey, you know what? I'm gonna go back down to my classified position now. That's a risk by, by creating these, um, these kinds of um, automatic triggers to immediately be reinstated to where you were prior to such appointment. And so I, I have a concern with that. And so in light of what was shared by the, the retiring speaker with respect to just how uncomfortable I am with advice and consent, and in light of how uncomfortable I am with how some of this language is going to tinker with the, um, the way we have a standardized practice of going about determining the executive pay structure, and the concerns I have with how the well-intended, you know, job security component that we're gonna to wanna to create for somebody in order to attract them into the position might actually result in the potential for empire building. I have a lot of, a lot of reasons to be concerned with um, moving forward Bill 337-34 at this time. I do want to say that if we don't pass this bill, it's just the status quo. We have advice and consent, the governor will appoint somebody to the position and that individual will come before this body and this body will have to decide whether or not um, that individual is worth holding the position. Um, I think that in recent history, advice and consent has shown that it does, have, uh, it does have quite a lot of weight with this body. And the outcomes of who holds those positions can be um, determined by the, by, purely by the advice and consent process. Perhaps, um, perhaps advice and consent should include greater transparency um, a, a more thorough vetting process besides a single public hearing, I don't know. But I, I think that, I mean, I, I really feel uncomfortable with how the various provisions within this Bill 337 are going to um, affect so many different facets while at the same time um, really affecting advice and consent. So um, I'm very uncomfortable with Bill 337 Dash 34. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Senator St. Nicholas. On the main motion, Senator Castro, you're recognized. On the main motion, Senator Espaldon, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I too have some reservations about this uh, legislation. However, we won't go there for now. What I do need is to ask a question to, and, and, and perhaps it's, uh, and it deals with statutory construction, how we actually are putting this bill together. And if we revert back to page two, line 10, uh, it, I'm not sure that I can follow what the sentence is. There is a word, let me just read the whole thing. 
uh, shall meet the following qualifications under Section B, have no less than 10 years of progressive experience in law enforcement agency and three years in a senior law enforcement position with, comma, or equivalent executive management. The first issue I have in terms of the construction of this is whether or not, and the question becomes whether on line nine, after the word agency, there is an and. There's 10 years of progressive experience in law enforcement agency, comma, and three years in senior law enforcement position. Uh, I, I guess the question is, is the three years on top of the 10 years of progressive experience, or is the three years included in the 10 years of progressive experience? Uh, Senator Stavis, do you yield to that question? I do, Madam Speaker. Um, it, I believe the reason the and is there is because it's an additional requirement. Now, in terms of um, time or temporal, it's not necessarily 15 plus three. You have to look at it in one single application, one single requirement, and one other requirement, however that requirement is made. Um, I think the numbers kind of throw it up, throw it, a, throw it out, but if you were to just read it without the numbers, it would, you would see that I, the and is accurate, um, and this, this did go through legal bureau as, as part of the bill process. And also keep in mind that this language was directly taken from the current statute. That's, uh, that's part of the requirements for the chief of police. So this is not new language. This is not inconsistent. This is taken from statute, copied and pasted for requirements for customs and quarantine. And so um, I, I hope that answers the question. Uh, but as I understand it, it's, it's an additional requirement. But in terms of time itself, it's not 18 years cumulative. It could be 18 years cumulative, or it could be 12 and, 12 and 3. Um, for a total of 15 years with the three years as senior because senior customs enforcement or senior law enforcement positions counts towards progressive experience in law enforcement. Um, I hope that answers, a, answers the question. It, it, it does. And bottom line, it could be either interpreted either way, uh, whether it's going to be three years on top of the 10 years or whether it's going to be three years included in the 10 years. And I guess that's, you know, we'll, we'll live with that for now. Um, but it, it may be, and even though it was taken directly from some requirements that are in law right now, it doesn't necessarily mean that it was statutorily constructed correctly. And that's why I had to at least ask that question. However, in that same phrase, uh, and three years in a senior law enforcement position with comma, I'm not sure if the with should be there because with what? I, I, yeah, because the following after the word with, there's a comma or equivalent executive management experience. So I'm not sure uh, in terms of statutory construction how, now, how that, what that really implies. And so I do pose that question to the mover. Of Senator Estevez, do you yield to the question? I, I do, Mad Madam Speaker, and I'll answer to the best of my abilities. As I understand that, it's supposed to be very open. So there could be a combination of 15 years progressive experience, three years senior experience, or a combination. So with mixes of executive management positions in a similar field, or. And so if it's or, you could have either or. So it would be 15 and one. 15 in another, and it, with the width, I think uh, allows for a mix of the two. So I could have maybe 10 years in customs, five years in senior and execu senior executive, and of that of that 10 years in customs and the progressive experience, for three of those years I was senior management, and so it allows for that flexibility. This type of language actually is not even uncommon. You find this in 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 almost all federal job openings where they require either something specific in the field or equivalent experience or a mix of the two. 
And so I don't believe that this language is very inconsistent with the type of, of open calls and job requirements that are placed on other jobs, job positions. And I, I hope that assists my colleague and I hope that answers the question. Senator Espada, if, if it's okay with you, we're gonna take a one minute recess. Yeah, please, Madam Speaker. One minute recess. Senator Espadon, you're recognized. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, for that recess. I was able to confer with uh, the mover of this uh, legislation uh, along with legal counsel. So when we take a look at section, subsection B on page 2, I would like to make a uh, proffer an amendment, and it will be in several different places, but we'll go one at a time. Uh, it reads right now, subsection B, have no less than 10 years of progressive experience in law enforcement agency, and then we strike the word and, and, in, and insert the words including, at least. Those are the three words that will replace the word and. So it will be including at least three years in senior law enforcement positions. So that would be my first amendment. Thank you, Senator. On the amendment, would anyone like to be recognized? Is there any objection to the amendment? Hearing no objection, motion carries. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And then we continue on. So now we have it reading, uh, including at least three years in a senior law enforcement position. And this is where I'd like to switch the words with and or vice versa. So it should now read, uh, include, uh, including at least three years in senior law enforcement position or with equivalent executive management experience in the field of public administration and so forth. So the two words, we have a, a with right now, it has with, comma, or. I would like to replace the with, comma, or with the words or with. No comma. No comma. All right, and, the or, and the or will come before the word with. All right. On the amendment, would anyone like to speak? Is there any objection to the amendment? Hearing no objection, motion carries. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And the reason why I wanted to make those amendments is because when we are, uh, it becomes perhaps a lot easier to read so that people won't misinterpret what the intention of, of this uh, legislation may be should it pass. I do have some concerns as expressed by the other speakers before me, but I'm willing to hear more argument on this matter. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Senator. On the bill. Are there any other speakers on the bill? If not, Senator Estevez, you may close on the bill. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I rarely ever um, have to look at my phone, but unfortunately, this is where I have the notes in front of me um, that I put up. Uh, you know, there, there have been concerns, and I would just like to, to read aloud because a lot of this language was taken, and I appreciate the work of my colleagues. And this is, this is again, this is not new. This is stuff that this body has applied. Yules Latour and Guahan finds that subsection 3105 of Chapter 3, Title 5, GCA, establishes specific qualifications and criteria for the fire chief position of the Guam Fire Department. The criteria essentially requires that the candidate be or have been a career employee with either the local or federal fire department possessing no more than 10 years of experience. So basically, this is the legislative intent of the bill that created the qualifications for the fire chief and the police chief. The language very similar in varying degrees. And the legislative intent was very clear on why they needed to do these things. This is not reinventing the wheel, Madam Speaker. Um, within this bill, it, it requires 10 years experience within fire control and extinguishment and 15 years experience in fire control, including control and extinguishment of fires and fire prevention, of which four years must be served in a position equivalent to battalion chief or higher. This was language that, you know, would be argued today as very restrictive, but we have not seen the inability to the, pay these positions or to find people to fill these positions. In fact, it's been a benefit to the agencies because the recruitment has been from within these positions. I'd also like to refer to another section. 
In, this, in the law that established it, Ilesatur and Guahan intends to authorize the use of the three-year income average as the compensation level of, for an active classified employee who is nominated for fire chief or police chief if it is the higher than the established compensation level for the position of chief. And that's based on the legislative intent that finds that the active employee selected to fill the position is not necessarily guaranteed reinstatement. Um, however, in this bill, it does provide for that, but it acknowledges the difficulties that we've had filling these positions. Um, I understand the concerns. I understand, and, and it's just a surprise to me, um, such a change in the consistency of this body. This has been the measure of this body to have requirements, and albeit maybe it seems a bit too stringent, but I do have concerns that at least two members of this body supported this measure, and that one particular member was the sponsor of said legislation. And so I don't necessarily subscribe in this current time, unless there's been a drastic change, that the argument that this bill is too restrictive, in, in, too restrictive for recruitment is a valid one. It makes no sense. And I think it further enforces the idea that the, the, the public at large is correct that positions are too often filled with, with, too often filled with people who are owed political patronage versus their true qualifications. And in these types of organizations where we feel that there is a strong need for strong leadership that requires experience, that most especially requires experience within that field, um, is, is needed now more than ever in these agencies. And so, again, with this, I understand there are concerns. I'd like to refer, though, to the previous consistent positions of this body, starting with the 32nd Guam Legislature, on ensuring that we have the most qualified individuals fill these positions, and not people who are potentially underqualified or potentially placeholders uh, because something is owed to them because of promises made during a campaign. And so I humbly ask my colleagues to please support this measure. Madam Speaker, if I may, as a point of information, uh, the retiring speaker indicated that one of the members here who's uh, objecting to this or has reservations was the one that sponsored a bill. He's very correct. I was the one that introduced the bill so that it actually that was done for the fire chief. And at the time, the governor had sent down two candidates. Both candidates were rejected. And the only one that stepped up at the time was Chief Nicholas. But he also had indicated that, look, I'm, I'm, gonna, be, I'm gonna be taking a drop in pay. Um, and, and so, you know, he was, his pay range was here as the director was here. So, so, so this legislature worked to accommodate that candidate, and he turned out to be a very good chief. Now, <clears throat> under those circumstances, I thought that, I think at that time, and the legislature certainly agreed, that that was good policy given those circumstances. And in fact, the legislature even went one step further because the law only allows an acting to, to sit in the position for a short period of time. But because at the time, that individual, the chief, was being deployed, and he wouldn't be back for another 12 months. So we also amended the legislation to allow the acting uh, chief to sit in for a longer period of time. So again, you know, the circumstances back then, so to say that, well, we've done it before, so therefore it's good today, I think we really need to take a look at what the circumstances were then. Thank you. Sorry. Senator Stevis has closed on the bill. Is there any objection to placing Bill 337 as amended on the third reading file? Hearing no objection, motion carries. We're on Bill 338, Senator Stevis. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Bill 338, very similar to 337, um, you know, in the interest of time, 
uh, basically applies requirements, the same requirements um, or very similar requirements as the customs chief to the director of Department of Corrections. And so with that, I understand that there have been several um, amendments made to the prior bill and I do expect them to follow into this bill. Um, it basically does the same thing, however highlighted for Department of Corrections. And so with that, I'll, I will allow my colleagues to digest and uh, propose their amendments. On the bill, Senator St. Nicholas, you are recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. In light of the similarities between this bill and the bill we previously cleared, um, notwithstanding any objections from my colleagues, I'd like to make a motion to have legal um, provide the necessary technical amendments to apply the same amendments of the prior legislation to this legislation um, wherever practical. And that might, that might be able to help us clear a, a huge hurdle in having to go through all of them all over again. Thank you, Madam Speaker. On that motion, is there any objection? Hearing no objection, motion carries. On the bill. Senator Estevez, you may close on the bill. All right, is there any objection to placing bill number 338-34 as amended by legal counsel uh, on the third reading file for voting? Is there any objection? Hearing no objection, motion carries. Senator Steves, you are recognized on Bill Number 291. Madam Speaker, at this time, I'd like to move to to move it further down. I do. The requests for information have been placed out. Um, also, understanding that there are kind of restrictions on the time zone, so I personally um, have reached out to transplant centers um, in the mainland between calling them between uh, one and, and five, and email inquiries have been sent out. However, to allow them a little bit more time to provide their response, um, I, would, I would move that we move it further down um, on the agenda, if possible, to allow them adequate time. If, if um, there's an objection to that, then I would then move to just place it into the third reading and provide the information to my colleagues as it comes prior to voting. There are only two bills left on the agenda. Do you want to push it down or you want to move, make the mo if, if motion to move it to third reading right now? Say again? Or would you like to continue with the motion to place it on third reading right now? Do you have, considering the time difference, Madam Speaker, is it your intent to recess this body um, any anytime soon with two bills left on the agenda or are we looking to push everything through? We're going to vote on Friday, and in order to do that, councils ask that we recess today so that they can engross all the bills tomorrow. They haven't been able to gross any of them. So, With that then, Madam Speaker, I will then withdraw my previous motion and make the motion to place Bill 291 into the third reading file for voting. All right. On the motion to place Bill number 291 as amended uh, on the third reading file, is there any objection? Is that an objection? Uh, on the motion, Madam Speaker, some information was requested, so that information then is not going to be provided? He said it might be provided before voting. He's going to try. But it's, it's not available right now. Mad Madam Speaker, just to reiterate, as a point of information, the information requested yesterday, there is a time difference. So, so the, the Guam doesn't have a transplant center. And so the best source to adequately provide the information I believe that was being sought based on the question was referred to the specialized facilities, um, particularly in states that have very similar legislation. And so those calls were put out at a reasonable time in their business hours, which was between the hours of, of uh, like 11 a.m. to a four or 11 p.m. to 4, 4 a.m. our time. And so it's not that the information is not going to be provided. It's that due to the time difference, um, I would try to allow maximum time for these different 
uh, resources to provide their feedback. And so there is every intention to provide whatever we have to my colleagues for their digestion prior to voting on Friday. Senator Lee, is, is there an objection to the motion? Oh, on the motion to place on third reading? Yes, just a point of information, Madam Speaker. Um, I rose previously um, to discuss this measure and I um, shared some concerns that I had with regard to continuing education and the opportunity for our community as a whole to discuss this and be better educated and be better trained, especially for um, government employees. Um, so I took a look at what could possibly be an amendment to this bill, um, but realized that that would make the bill, it, it would require changes to different sections of the code. And so it would make this bill materially different and would likely slow down this process. Um, so I will withdraw that and in the hopes that we can, that this is something that we might be able to address in the 35th form legislature. To just Masi. Is this to speak on the bill, Senator? Okay, um, on the motion, is, we're on the motion to place this bill 291 on third reading. Is there any objection? Hearing no objection, motion carries. Senator Ada. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Earlier, um, we were discussing Bill 348 uh, 34, and uh, that had, pertains to the conveyance of uh, property to the uh, estate of um, Artemio Elagan. And we had set aside that bill in order to get some clarification. A member requested uh, for some clarification on the bill. Um, after discussions with the Department of Land Management uh, Chief Planner, uh, I believe that the questions and concerns uh, have been adequately answered. Uh, and I, I spoke with the individual who had the concerns and indicated that he is fine with um, moving forward with Bill 348. Thank you, Senators. Um, there was also a motion earlier regarding the technical amendments by legal. Is there any objection to that? No objection. No objection to that. Motion carries. And um, is there any objection to placing bill number 348 as amended on the third reading file? Here, no, no objection. Motion carries. Uh, Madam Speaker, um, I know we got one more bill, and that was, um, that was bill 361. And, and 364. And 364, yes. Uh, and I would, I would just ask that at this time, um, I would like to make a motion, notwithstanding the House rules, to replace change out Bill 361-34, which is a rezoning bill, and replace it with Bill number 374-34. That is the bill that will bring clarification to um, the additional tax levy on real property improvements valued at one million dollars or more. And we have the uh, AG's opinion which supports the amendment that's being made. So I would just like to, to then um, replace Bill 361 with Bill 374-34 on the agenda. Is there any objection? Senator Rodriguez. Uh, Madam Speaker, I don't object to that motion. Uh, however, I don't know if um, another motion will be entertained after we complete these two bills. I did mention uh, my intention uh, during Committee on the Rules that I, I'm going to place, move to place Bill 350 um, on the session agenda. And had I know, if we're going down this, this path of um, having to stick to what we have here now and, and replacing, then I would have probably done that earlier. So I just, I just want to, to know what's, what's the intention are we going to be able to to place bill 350 on the agenda because i that's something that i did um uh make my intentions clear during core and it was just the uploading of the committee report i, I guess we're going to have to deal with that motion when it comes up senator well so so then uh that motion being made i also still have 
uh, four other bills that I would like to add on. No, Thank you. No, I don't think it's a motion yet, right? Um, we're still on the motion. That the okay, so we're still on the motion to replace Bill 361 with 374 on this agenda. Um, is there any objection to that motion? All right, so we are now on second reading 374. Senator Adda, you are recognized. Madam Speaker, if I, if I could, um, notwithstanding the House rules, move back to motions. There's a motion to go back to motions. Is there an objection? No objection? We're in motions. Thank you. Madam Speaker, I move to place Bill 350-34. COR as substituted by the Committee on Appropriations and Adjudication. Um, it is an act to provide an annual continuing appropriation from the Recycling Revolving Fund to provide payment for a prior year obligation resulting from a 2001 license agreement executed by CLTC for 25,000 metric tons of metallic and other waste removal from the island of Guam and also approving and authorizing the CLTC to make amendments to the 2001 license agreement on to the session agenda. We're going to have to take a 10 minute recess for audio. So we're on 10 minute recess.
We're back in session. Senator Rodriguez made a motion to place bill number, we're in wonder motions, and Senator Rodriguez had made a motion to place bill number 350 on the second reading file on the agenda. The bill is uploaded on the, the committee report is uploaded on the website. On the motion? Is there any objection to placing bill number 350 on the agenda? Hearing no objection, motion carries. Uh, Madam Speaker, since we're still in motions. Senator Ada. Uh, I would like to um, add bill number 369-34, which pertains to the sale of the old De La Corte Street in, um, in Aganya. Uh, to the contiguous landowner. This is similar to uh, what we entertained at the last session uh, with the EC development. On the motion, is there any objection to placing Bill 369 on the agenda? Hearing no objection, motion carries. Madam Speaker, I'd like to place Bill 370-34 it's a bill that would authorize the uh, PD mayor to uh, lease to the Guam Telephone Authority uh, property uh, in, in PD uh, for a period of 50 years. Uh, this is property that has been under the administrative jurisdiction of the PD mayor for the longest time. On the motion to place Bill 370 on the second reading, is there any objection? Hearing no objection, motion carries. Senator Steffes, you are recognized. Um, Madam Speaker, I got one more. Senator Ada. Uh, we would like to place uh, Bill 156-34. Uh, this is the bill to extend the lease of the Manjita Farms in Jigo. On the motion, is there any objection? I object. All in favor, raise your hand. Wait, wait, wait. I think you're supposed to be presiding, madam. So if you want to object, I think you need to come down on the floor. There's an objection on the floor. All in favor, please raise your hand. Point of information. This is just place it on the agenda. Correct. Bill 156 34, the Manhita Farms. One, two, three, four, five, six. Motion fails. Senator Stavis, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Speaker. On behalf of the Committee on um, Public Utilities, I'd like to move the nomination of Mark G. Miller, Commissioner, PUC, Public Utilities Commission, into the voting file. On the motion to place the nomination in the voting file, is there any objection? Hearing no objection, motion carries. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to move place bill 368-34, which is relative to um, providing an appropriation to conservation officers on behalf of the uh, Committee on Public Safety onto the, onto the session agenda. What is the number again? Bill 368-34. On the motion, is there any objection? Hearing no objection, motion carries. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Senator Ogden, you are recognized. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, uh, in a brief discussion with the sponsor of the legislation, um, I would like to move that Bill number 363-34, which was previously considered by the body and is now in the third reading file, that that be reverted back to the second reading for a technical correction or for a correction in the amendment. The qualifying certificate.
on the motion to place to remove Bill 363 from the third reading file and place it back on second reading. Is there any objection to that motion? Hearing no objection, motion carries. We are now on second reading on bill number 374 and we are going to recess until 10 o'clock tomorrow.